This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Thank you. Uh, to you're all very welcome to this morning's Health Committee meeting. Um, I declare the meeting now open to the public. And I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing this morning, which at this point is pa Cameron, Paula Bradshaw and Alan Chambers. Um, I would like to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. And members, in terms of apologies, the clerk has received an ap apologies from Orlea Flynn and Carol Nicolin, and both Orlea and Carol have advised the clerk uh, in writing that for this committee meeting they are delegating authority to myself to vote on their behalf. Are members aware of any other apologies? Just Carol, Chair. Yes, we have received. Yes, my apologies there. We have received an apology in from Cara as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on then to chairperson's business. Um, first of all, I just wanted uh, to mention, members, there is a, a rural women's network event in the Long Gallery today. I'm sure you're all aware of it. Uh, if possible, if we can conclude our meeting for one o'clock, it would maybe give us an opportunity, anyone that wants to attend that, but we'll see how the meeting progresses. Um, I did want to mention the fact that this is Baby Loss Awareness Week. And I think it's an issue that we feel uh, acutely, acutely aware of, the difficulties and the stresses and distress that that has for people, um, and, and we're, we're deeply conscious of that. Also, the 10th of October is World Mental Health Day, um, again, a significant issue and one which the committee has taken a particular interest in. Um, the other issue I wanted to mention briefly was the radiology recall and the, the worrying news and information that has come out again from that recall in terms of 66 discrepancies identified in the review. And I just thought it would maybe be timely, members, that we seek an update from the department in relation to, to that issue. Would members be content with that? Great. Sure. Great. Thank you, members. And the final item, members, that I just want to touch upon is it's my understanding that Chiara Hunter will be moving on to another committee and will be, will be leaving the Health Committee. So I just wanted to acknowledge 
Cara's work and and uh, the the very generous and and a uh, cooperative way that she engaged with the committee and she came into a committee at a very very busy time and um, has brought a particular interest in terms of the, the mental health issues and and we have recently been discussing um, how how she had shared some of her own a. Uh, medical experience in a way that, that I think many of us feel would be very helpful to people out there in, in the community. So I want to thank Cara for her input into the committee and to wish her the very best in the time ahead in any other any other committees or any other work she's engaged in. Um, I'll more Cara. So um, that's the everything then, members, in terms of Chair's business. Moving on to the draft minutes, I refer you to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 7th of October, which, is at, which are at tab 3.1. Are members content with those minutes? Yep, members content, thank you. And there are no matters arising from the minutes, members. So we're able then to move on now to our first substantive briefing of the day, which is coming from the Royal College of Nursing. Um, this briefing is focused on key workforce issues for nurses, and I refer members to papers at tab 5.1 and 5.2 of your pack. So I first of all like to welcome in turn Ms Fiona Devlin, who is chair of the RCN uh, board here in the north. Can you hear us okay, Fiona? I can, chair. Good morning to everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. We also are joined by Ms Rita Devlin, and Rita is the interim director of RCN. Can you hear us okay, Rita? I can. Morning, Chair. Morning. Thank you. Uh, Ms Anne-Marie Marley, who is a member of the RCN. Anne-Marie, can you hear us okay? I think she's just left the call, Chair, so we'll so bring we, her on when... Yeah, we, we think we may have lost temporarily Anne-Marie, but we will bring her on and we will continue on with the briefing and we'll bring Anne-Marie on when she comes back. And we also have Miss Connie Mitchell, I hope, which is uh, Connie's an RCN member as well. Can you hear us okay, Connie? I can. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would just welcome, I, I would just uh, indicate to everyone that the use of headphones, particularly online, is helpful. But also, if everyone could make sure you're on mute if you're not speaking, that can uh, help with the sound quality. We can sometimes get background noise or kind of interference if people aren't on mute. So before I go back to Fiona to check how you want to do the briefing in terms of which you are leading on the briefing, Fiona, I just want to say that I think the committee particularly welcome this briefing today. I think we're very, very conscious of the difficulties that frontline staff and, and nursing are having in terms of the length of time they've been working under tremendous stress and pressure, um, and not only from COVID, but even preceding COVID, that the pressures were mounting within the system, the vacancies were there within the system, and that they, you know, that to to and to the extent that nursing unprecedentedly uh, were forced to take industrial action around pay and also around safe staffing, which I think continue to be issues and uh, I just I just think that that uh, this is an important briefing and I hope we do get some uh, I hope we do get a, a good engagement in that respect um, so I'll go back just to check with you Fiona how are you how are you want to do the briefing and then we'll go to members questions following your input Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank yourself and the committee for giving us this opportunity to present uh, evidence to uh, the committee on issues affecting our members right across Northern Ireland. So, first of all, I'd like to ask Rita Devlin um, to um, present the opening remarks and, and issues that we would like to highlight and then open it up to questions for the rest of uh, the members here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both chairs. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to highlight the key nursing workforce issues for nurses in Northern Ireland. Um, and we hope that the committee will find the session helpful and informative. Our briefing paper, as you know, covers a number of specific issues, and that's the current pressures on the nursing workforce across the health service and the independent sector and the uh, safe staffing and nurse and workforce planning pay and reward and nursing leadership so i don't intend to replicate that here um, because you've already read it but i would like to briefly refer to the annex that we submitted uh, with the paper which is the sense maker report uh, in March 2020, the RCN began a project aimed at gathering the lived experience of nurses in Northern Ireland. It was initially to celebrate the year of the nurse and midwife, but it very quickly turned into a historical record of nurses' experience uh, of working through a pandemic. 
the project used SenseMaker methodology, so sent patient, uh, participants telling their own stories and then using an interactive tool, they also make sense of their own story. Um, and it's this findings from this project that we'd like to focus on briefly in the introductory remarks. SenseMaker allowed us to capture lots of really valuable data, but I want to focus on three key areas, and these were uh, the importance of teamwork, the impact of bad management practices and poor communication, and the resilience that feelings of hope can deliver. In relation to teamwork, there were many positive examples of how nurses rapidly adapted to new ways of working and used their professional judgment to deal with unknown and new situations caused by the pandemic. The importance of teamwork and a sense of camaraderie were highlighted as key enablers of resilience. And where teams were able to stay together and meet challenges head on, they reported being much more engaged and to an extent protected by one another as they then had an established team ethos. What became very apparent, however, was the negative impact that redeployment had on nurses' ability to cope. A major theme in the stories was of teamwork and camaraderie being disrupted by redeployment nurses having to work on wards with little guidance and support. Some nurses redeployed five times within a short period of time. And there was evidence of increasing tensions between nurses at various levels of seniority or experience in the absence of clear protocols or, or role clarity. The lack of an established team led some nurses to describe feelings of loneliness, isolation, and a loss of competence and confidence so for me, a key lesson that we need to learn is that we need to think long and hard before disrupting well-established and highly functioning teams, as they are much more than the sum of their parts. Communication and transparency around decision-making makes a big difference to whether nurses feel valued and motivated. During COVID, there's no doubt that some management behaviours contributed to staff distress. The lack of engagement and changes that affect nursing is driving down morale and, in my view, contributing to an increase in sickness absence levels that we are experiencing. Nurses are exhausted and fearful for the future, and we believe that we are often treated with disrespect, pushed from pil pillar to post on the whim of some managers. Whilst a sense of urgency was understandable in the early days of the pandem pandemic, poor behaviours were not. RCN members reported being instructed to redeploy or face the consequences, whilst others were told that if they didn't like it, they knew where the door was. These same managers are now wondering why they can't retain nursing staff. The stories highlight the need for open communication and the creation of channels for feedback and understanding, as well as involving nurses in decision-making, integrating their deep experience gained on the ground at the front line. A common experience shared in the stories was about nurses hearing news about redeployment or other issues through the media rather than via internal management channels of communication. Nurses reported feeling confused and unsettled by rapid changes in guidance and the issuing of frequently contradictory information. The learning from this is the importance of ensuring, ensuring good management practices, working with staff to help support them through change and communicating directly with them when potential changes are being discussed. Our workforce across the health service and in the nursing and residential care home sector is our most precious asset. As we have seen, there is no health service without nurses. Treating people with respect must be a key managerial behaviour if we are to stem the flow of nurses telling us they intend to leave the profession because of their treatment. And after all, we do know nurses leave managers, not jobs. Finally, and perhaps on a more positive note, I need us all to think about the importance of sustaining hope for our staff. Stress and exhaustion have been running at high levels throughout the year. Burnout is a very real concern. However, through the year, hope was the most prominent positive emotion expressed by nursing staff, followed by pride. The narrative around the health and social care system is constantly negative and for good reason. Whilst innovation and adaptations are being discussed with strategies supporting a transition into recovery, the nurses' stories raise questions about how the implementation of change will impact on those who are already working at full capacity due to operational service pressures. They can barely think beyond getting through the day, never mind planning for the future, whatever that might bring. However, it has been identified that, that hope is a particularly resilient emotion that can be present even in the most difficult circumstances. 
So we, and that's all of us, politicians, trade unions, uh, professional bodies, must find ways to bring hope into the picture. Hope that things can get better and hope that everyone around us are fully committed to making things better for our patients and for our, our staff. This means being proactive, anticipating the next stage of recovery and rebuilding to consolidate what we have learned and to apply it to the future. This means holding employers, the Department of Health and the Northern Ireland Executive to account in delivering on those factors that can make life better and more hopeful for our weary and dispirited nursing staff. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rita. And um, um, certainly I, I would share your concerns and, I, and I, I imagine I speak for the entire committee when we certainly hope that we can do everything we can to assist in, in this relation, uh, in, in relation to the pressures that continue on yourselves and your, your workforce. I will just declare my own interest in, in relation to having worked as a social worker and uh, being on a leave of absence from a, one of the trusts and my wife being a nurse in a community team as well. Um, so, in, in, in relation to in relation to the, the the pride and the hope and pride, and, and actually, I want to just say as well that that we also are proud of the role that nurses play in healthcare, but also the, the key role that they played within the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And in relation to the issue of moving and reallocating, and maybe potentially lack of support or indeed uh, additional pressure being put on around all of that. Is there any engagement with yourselves, Rita, in relation to um, if, if, if there were to be further surges, how that issue could be mitigated or how support could be put in place or how those relocations could be done in a way that supports nursing to ensure that they feel they, they don't feel the loneliness and isolation that you have that you have referenced there, Rita? Um, I would say there's very little um, working together on this at the minute with the trade unions and the professional bodies. Um, we do have local trade unions that work in partnership with the employers, but oftentimes, rather than planning, we're, we still seem to be quite reactive in the way that we're responding. I mean, we are in the midst of probably um, a surge. Um, it looks like this surge may be tapering off, but as sure as, as, as there's no doubt that the next surge is probably round the corner and as yet we aren't seeing um, a great deal of that sort of looking at forward forward plan and I know they're trying to do some work around green sites um, green site places where they can have surgery moving forward and I know that there has been a group set up that we have been invited to sit on in terms of trying to look at how we can improve surgical access for patients, but it could be, it could, it could be, and needs to be much better. Okay, thank you. And then, just I want to check: do, do any of the other members of your panel want to make opening remarks, Rita, or do you want me to go on ahead with with uh, broader questions now? Um, no, I think they're they're content to, to answer the questions. Um, Okay. Chair. Okay, thank you. So, um, if I could ask the panel if there are if there are questions, if if a member of the panel could lead on the question and indicate who wants to pick up the question, and then if there's additional information, maybe someone else can come in. But if we could have someone kind of leading on the answer. So, thanks for your presentation, Rita. Much much to be concerned about, both in that and in terms of the very uh, useful but concerning written briefing that you provided to the committee. And I'm going to go first of all to the whole workforce strategy and whether or not you feel that the department has a, a, wor a workforce strategy in place for nursing with targets and an an, a, implementation plans uh, to meet those targets or actions. Is that in place at present? I don't see evidence of it, Chair, at the minute. We have, as you know, delivering care, and that is the policy framework for, for nursing in Northern Ireland. And delivering care tells us how many nurses that we need. However, I don't see, um, and, and, and possibly it's because I'm not involved, but I don't see outworkings of workforce planning that's going to look at what, what, what nursing for the future will look like, um, what, what kind of nurses we need to have, what kind of specialty nurses we need to have. I don't know that there's anybody making the links between the nurses who are coming into the service and those who will be leaving. Um, it could be happening, but we're not involved in it um, that I can see um, 
to any extent. I'll ask Fiona because Fiona chairs our safe staffing committee if she has any anything else to add to that. Thank you, Rita. Yes, as Rita has clearly said, the, um, we don't see the, the workings out of anything. We know that uh, currently in the acute sector we have numbers of 54 to 46 registrant to non-registrant, where there should be an 80 to 20 split of cover. Take that over into the community side, and we don't have the numbers at all. We have, in some teams, 86 uh, percent of the staffing down, not there. So how do we deliver care? And they would say that moving forward, as um, Rita has clearly said there about delivering care policy framework, the staff are clearly saying that there is a squeeze on them, that they need to fix the, the here and now before any vision and carrying forward on a workforce can take place. So we, we don't see uh, the numbers. We actually see the exit uh, ramping up. There's a huge amount of staff, especially in community and with the pressures, are leaving far earlier than would normally have been anticipated. We can't retain them. Um, and uh, as earlier alluded in regards to the redeployment of staff, I think the lack of um, communication, the lack of compassionate leadership shown to staff has meant that it has a very raw effect now on the workforce. So I, I think we all have to get around the table moving forward to try and implement um, policy and, and look at workforce, really look at it, rather than pay lip service to it, to actually uh, implement the, the policy framework um, that, that's needed to try and keep the service afloat. Yeah. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah. And Chair, can I just add that um, we're, we're still concerned, I think, that in Northern Ireland we, um, we commission and we workforce plan for the health service, for the HSC, but we have huge um, uh, community, uh, nursing home sector and residential sector, and um, we have more patients cared for in, in the um, care home sector than we do within the trusts. And yet, when we're looking at workforce planning, it seems to be specifically. So we commission student nurse places specifically for the health service. But we have this huge um, infrastructure of nursing homes where we also need registered nurses. And I don't, I'm not sure and I'm not convinced that that is being looked at when we do workforce planning as an overall for the services that our patients need today and tomorrow. Thanks, Rita. And yeah, and that is a concern, and actually was flagged was flagged to me as a concern even earlier this week in relation to the the ability to provide cover into that into that vulnerable sector, and that is something that's hugely of concern. And and in relation to that, and, and I take it on board, and you, and you are right to point out that all of that needs to be um, serviced with nurses of the correct experience and the correct uh, skills and and all of that. Um, so, and you had mentioned Fiona safe staffing. And is there a recognised standard, or are the department working actively with you? The committee has expressed their, their concern and their regret that safe staffing legislation wasn't advanced in this mandate. However, and we have sought uh, at last week's meeting, uh, within the last couple of weeks, an update from the department around their legislative planning. Um, but is there active work going on with the, yourselves and, and representative groups around what safe staffing would look like? Are there are there indications of uh, are there frameworks for what numbers or benchmarks for what numbers and what grades and experience will be needed to provide safe yeah. staffing? So we have delivering care chair, which is um, the policy framework for Northern Ireland, and it looks at how many nurses we need in each so mental health, um, learned disability, emergency. Uh, um, accident and emergency departments community. So we know from a profession point of view what we need to deliver safe care. Um, and that's very clear to us. Now, the independent sector is one of the phases. However, it hasn't progressed probably as, as quickly or as well as we would like it to progress. Um, it's a difficult um, it's a difficult um, sector, I think, to plan for and um, so the delivering care works very well and we're very content with that and, and we have been engaged in that from the start of it. Where the difficulties are in that when we're looking at the safe staff and legislation, so we have had two meetings with the, with the new bill team and with um, Phil Rogers, who's the workforce um, director of workforce. And um, 
We are progressing, but it is very, very slow. Um, it is, it is um, really something that we, you know, we get concerned about. It is, it is slow, and um, we want, I suppose, a bit more of a sense of urgency with it. Um, but one of the one of the questions that I asked at that group last week is how are we going to ensure that the safe staff and legislation works for um, the independent sector as well? Uh, because obviously our, our, our patients need care for and they need nursing care wherever they need it. So we need enough nurses to look after that, the, the patients in that sector. And those are our elderly and most vulnerable patients and we cannot have them having a second class service. So um, the safe staff and legislation is moving, but it's, um, it's a glacial pace, I, I have to say. Okay, um, thank you. And um, the other issue then that I wanted to ask you about was around that retention, and I know that's of, of huge concern, I have to say. Um, and, and again, in some ways, predates this in terms of how many of our nurses here we have working at the very top of their band and no progression through to allow those nurses to progress. But in terms of long term or short term or even, even medium term measures, what would the key issues be in terms of trying to retain and stabilise the workforce and uh, to meet the concerns that you're expressing here today? So, Chair, if you don't mind, I'm going to let Connie speak to you first about retention in the independent sector, and then I'll go to Anne-Marie, if that's OK, and then I'll come back to me. So, yeah. Connie, do you want to start first with retention within the independent sector and your difficulties? Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Chair. Um, Difficulties in the independent sector are quite clear. We cannot recruit and obviously we can't retain. And what our, our members of our network and uh, are saying are really we do want safe staffing levels, but we need to be able to have equity. We need our career progression as well. We also need an acuity tool because we have nurses um, uh, maybe working with up to 30 patients. Um, so we do need people to be valued and paid well, but we need investment in our sector. Thank you, Connie. And Anne-Marie, from a, an acute point of view? Ap apologies, Chair, that for whatever technical reason, um, I can't see. I hope you can hear me OK today. Um, that is a very valid point you've made about nurses being able to progress up through the banding. Um, the work that we do today compared to when I would have come into nursing 34 years ago has transformed completely and utterly. We have nurses leading services with nurses transforming care. Unfortunately, a lot of the time they're maybe sitting stuck at a band six um, let alone not even uh, achieving a band seven, despite having been able to assess, diagnose, treat and review patients, manage their ongoing care with bigger caseloads and more responsibility year on year uh, in, in being able to develop these services. And with the greatest respect to um, our other allied health professional colleagues, they seem to be able to stay connected clinically at higher banding than is the case for, for nurses and often nurses feel to progress in their career they maybe have to go down a managerial route to be able to do so which of course is of value but at this present time we need that knowledge and expertise as close to the patient as we can possibly have it and being able to be rewarded and valued for the level of, and the autonomous level at which they're working. Um, and we, we have the, the courses to be able to train and have our nurses qualified to that level, uh, but then they need to be recognised for what they're doing and um, remunerated for, for doing that level of work with that level of responsibility. Okay, thank you, Anrita. Yeah, I suppose just to say, you, you know, um, it's it's on record that the RCN have called for a retention strategy, Chair, and 
finally, that it, is, it has been agreed that that retention strategy is going to be um, led through the Chief Nurse's Office. Um, and I think, as far as I know, the first meeting is next week. Again, very slow. Um, we, have, we have been calling for this now for about two months. So I suppose better late than never. But we are, you know, we, we are, we're two months down the line and we're still no further forward. Um, we, the RCN asked our members a couple of weeks ago um, what would keep them in the service. Um, simple things, a career framework, um, I, I, I identified career path works, proper, proper banding for the work that they're doing, um, take away non-nursing duties. And, and you know, Chair, I did furnish um, uh, yourself with the list of non-nursing duties that, that, that our nurses are expected to do as, as part of their daily work. Um, and the whole issue that Anne-Marie has brought up about valuing clinical competence and rewarding clinical competence, but also um, environmental things. You know, our staff are unable to take tea breaks. When they too, do take tea breaks, there's nowhere for them to go. There's no hot food. There's no hot drinks at night. Um, they complain about off duties being constantly changed. So you could have an off duty today and it'll look nothing like the off duty that you, you work next week. Um, uh, better bank rates within the trust so that, you know, we are spent a huge amount of, of money on agency staff and yet our own trust bank um, remuneration is, is nowhere near what agencies are, are, are getting paid. And it seems like a false economy because you would think if the trust paid the agency rate, they would still be saving on the agency fee. Um, so we would still be better off. So all of those things um, would would go towards a, re a retention, some kind of a retention strategy. But also trusts aren't even doing exit interviews for staff who are leaving. So we don't know why some staff are leaving. We, as the RCN, know, but the trusts aren't collecting the data to inform themselves about how they can th do things differently. And um, finally, I think that we really need to get a handle on the violence and aggression that our members are facing day in and day out. Yes, it's in the emergency departments, but it's also in community placements. And Fiona will be able to tell you about that. Um, and it's also in the acute medical wards. In fact, we see it everywhere. We see violence and aggressions against nursing staff everywhere, and it is unacceptable. Okay, thank you, Rita. And actually, that, that does concern me. A number of elements of that do concern me. I have to say, in relation to the non-nursing duties, and I may get back to it, but I do want to get to other members as well, um, the non-nursing duties is an issue that, that was of concern. I did, I, I did raise it with the Minister, and I was pleased to see that at least one of those, in relation to portering, was put into the recent, the recent call, but I hope to get back to you on that. The other thing about exit interviews, since I have taken up this role, and certainly since I came onto this committee, I have been asked about exit interviews. I have been told, I think at times, I'll check the record, but I think I have been told at times that they are taking place. To me, they would be a key component, and I think uh, it would be useful to drill into either why they're not taking place, or if any of them have taken place, what they're, what they're telling uh, the, the trusts and the departments, because I think that's, that's key to getting kind of under the bonnet of why nurses are, are feeling that they are taking that after long training and commitment that they're being forced to, to leave the nursing profession, which we need them in so badly. So a final one from me, and hopefully a quickest one then, I'll go to members, but just want to touch on, on the pay award, and I acknowledge that, that you have recognised that Westminster need to, and the, the, the Treasury need to come up with a, a properly funded pay award. But I wanted to check with yourselves currently, are you engaging with the department on the pay award at the, uh, presently? Um, I'm going to let uh, Fiona answer that one because Fiona chairs the pay subgroup within RCN. Fiona. Thank you, Rita. Yes, at the moment, uh, Chair, we have written on three occasions to the First and Deputy First uh, Ministers asking for an urgent meeting to discuss about uh, the pay award and safe staffing. Uh, our members are frustrated because, um, yet again, it, it looks that there, there is not pay parity because, as we know, England, uh, Scotland and Wales have already went forward with a pay award to their members and staff, yet here we're still in a bit of 
bit of limbo. Now, I know Minister Swan has given assurance that um, if he could secure the funding that's required um, to support that in the absence of the Barnet Consequentials, that um, he will um, give the award of 3%. But um, if you look at members looking in, they are disgruntled, they're frustrated, and they feel that there, there is a disparity in pay at the moment, but also the pay award does not reflect um, the, the, as Amory had said earlier, the, the value of nursing, the work that we do, the complexity, the um, just the, the role of nursing uh, in itself. This comes nowhere near, and we also uh, know that the reason why uh, last year that the RCN members and other unions joined us stood on picket lines with industrial action and strike was because of the the lack of um, acknowledgement of the, the, the worth of nursing uh, over years. We're 15 percent less well off now than we were 10 years ago. Um, so, and that uh, while it's you know we talk about recruitment and retention. Um, safe staffing is the, the biggest issue, but pay and safe staffing go hand in hand. You, you cannot separate them. And to try and recruit and retain, you need to to remunerate accordingly uh, to the the worth of that role. And currently, our members feel that they are not being uh, recognised for the the role and complexity of that role and responsibility that uh, they're taking uh, on board. Yep. So. Thank, thank you, Fiona. And just, just, to, just to double check, are, is there, are there ongoing engagements directly with the Department of Health at this point on that issue? No. Okay. 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 There's thank no you. engagement of, around pay at all at the minute. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go then to other members. So I'm going to first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then will be going to Paula Bradshaw, Jerry, and Alan in that order. So go ahead, please, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, ladies, for your attendance um, to committee this morning. Obviously, we're very grateful for your, your detailed brief, and uh, I just wanted to pay tribute to the staff, um, nursing and midwifery um, staff, um, because we all understand that really uh, they've been at the cold face throughout the, the face of this pandemic, and we also understand from your briefing that you've been grappling with rising pressures in the workplace over many years. So we do appreciate the, the wonderful work that you do do. So thank you for that. Um, it's very distressing to, to hear and and to, to see evidence of abusive and violent behaviour against um, the staff. And, and obviously we absolutely condemn such pathetic and very poor behaviour. Um, and we, we would like to see, uh, and, and we would certainly support stricter sentencing and penalties for those who would be found guilty of, of those type of offences. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that surge in abuse against the nursing and midwifery staff and what, if any, response has been taken by Department of Health or Department of Justice um, to date on the issue? So, so it's not new. Um, th th this behaviour is not new, but we're seeing an increase in it. And some of it, I think, is triggered by the fact that patients are at the end of their tether. They can't get the health care that they need. They're waiting around in AD departments. And as you can imagine, some of our patients are waiting 24, 36 hours. Now, there is no excuse for violence and aggression, but the frustration within the system is building to, you know, a breaking point for some people. And um, so it's not new, but it's also not acceptable. We have written to, so we, we, we did have a meeting with some of our staff or some of our members, and they told us that some of their issues are around a, a complete lack of security within departments, um, an inability to, to have the, um, I suppose it, it nipped in the bud at the very at the very outset that people don't seem to understand that this is unacceptable behaviour. The thing about it is, if you work in an ED department, you feel responsible not not only for the patients in there, but also for the for the visitors waiting in the waiting room. And so it's a huge burden of responsibility. And nurses should not have to share that on their own. So we wrote to all the trust to ask them about their security arrangements. Um, we also are now in the process, and I know the Minister, um, Minister Schwann wrote to the trusts as well to ask the same questions. I have to say the responses were um, not overly 
um, helpful or useful in terms of there didn't seem to be any recognition um, and indeed one trust ask us for the evidence to support it um, but there doesn't seem to be any recognition of this as, as a, a day and daily experience of nurses within the service so we did the minister wrote to the trust as well i don't know what response he got but we are at this current time planning a round table discussion on violence and aggression for healthcare staff, which we are, are doing in conjunction with the BMA and the Royal College of Midwives. And we are inviting the, the police service, the PPS, um, the Minister for Justice will have an invite. Um, and we do hope with that round table that we'll be able to think about some practical things that can be done for our staff because going into work day in and day out and facing the stresses and pressures that they're facing and on top of that the whole threat of violence and aggression from patients but also from relatives um it's, it's from the whole gambit um is soul destroying there's no other word for it it is absolutely soul destroying thank you for that answer rita um my next question is in around um what mechanisms exist for staff who feel their current job description is out of kilter with their banding um, to challenge or appeal this? And uh, are any opportunities that are out there are they are they communicated um, well by trusts? Um, I'm going to let Fiona answer that one, please, Fiona. Thank you, Rita. Um, there, there is a system in place across all the trusts in re relation to job evaluation and uh, desktop matching. However, what we found um, pre-COVID that the panels to try and get these together has been um, restricted, uh, not enough people to, uh, available to do it, and not really given the, the priority to do it. Meanwhile, for example, um, I'll give that the district nursing teams back in 2004 raised about their uh, banding and, and their, their job description, job role. That was only passed in 2019 as to um, acknowledging the banding uplift that they should have got. So it took that length of time. Um, with COVID then, all panels right across uh, the trust were stood down. We have a huge backlog of um, job evaluations where people are sitting on the wrong banding. It's not acknowledging uh, the role and responsibilities that they have been carrying out for some time. And it's um, basically under agenda for change, uh, you know, the, the job evaluation that was put in place alongside this should have been uh, given priority. But unfortunately, it's not given the priority that it's entitled to right across the trust. So we are having huge problems with panels meeting to try and progress this. Meanwhile, our members continue to work on the, the band and that's not appropriate to, to them. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, um, thank you for that. And um, probably, probably the last one for me from now, um, Chair. The, the Health Minister um, has argued a level of agency staff will always be required to ensure flexibility. So how does RCM have a view on what that should translate into in terms of staff numbers and um, and what would that translate into in terms of annual cost? I, I'm going to let Anne-Marie answer this from an, a, a, at the beginning from um, an acute nursing point of view and then I'll, I'll maybe come in at the, the end of that. Anne-Marie, if um, she's still hello, there. That, that, yes, I'm here, yes. Um, so, I, I agree that we are always going to be slightly dependent on um, agency staff um, for, for short-term sick leave and short-term cover, but it's really, really important to have established, connected teams on your permanent um, roster in terms of training, expertise, knowing how the ward environment or the community team work. So that is how we bring about the best quality of care for patients, is having robust, stable teams that can do the job that they know at like the back of their hand. However, we also know that some nurses need the, the flexibility of working through agency. Some of them are also very highly skilled. We, we couldn't run off-duty rotas without them at the, at the present time. And again, it comes back to slightly more remuneration for what 
the, for the work that they're doing. Um, but it definitely in terms of the clinical outworking of this, we, we, we want to bolster and boost um, our, our, our safe staffing uh, numbers for, for teams who, who know how, how the whole system works, rather than being dependent on ringing around and trying to get shifts filled through agency. And I'm just Thank going to you. bring Connie in here in terms of the impact of agency within the um, independent sector, if you don't mind, Connie. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Chair. Um, the use of agency, as we said, is required for ad hoc, but a lot of homes are having to rely on them for nurses for covering weeks and weeks of rotas. Um, it is having an impact because when we try to maintain the same people to keep continuity of care and maintain a team, it doesn't always work like that. But the costs alone in the independent sector are soaring. And it's even got to the point now where we're actually having difficulty getting agency staff. So we are to cover any gifts, nurses and carers. So it's having a detrimental impact, having to use so many agency. But we do see the point for ad hoc shifts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the RCN would would support the the idea that we will always <clears throat> need agency to give us that bit of flexibility to flex up and flex down when we need it. Um, our concern is that some wards now are being run nearly totally by agency, um, and if you're the if you're one of the the staff who um, are are part of the established, work, that's very very difficult because what you're trying to do is you're trying to um, um, get the agency staff up to speed so you're looking after them as well as trying to do your own work and we have a view that there is a group within the health, within the department that looks at reduction of agency which which the trade unions do sit on um, but we, we have said very clearly reduction of agency will happen when we have enough nurses in the system and when we have enough nurses who are properly remunerated within the system and where we have um, a system that values um, the, the nurses and what they do. So agency is a stopgap, absolutely. We will always need a degree of it. And a lot of our members work within agencies and they're, they're absolutely fabulous nurses, but it is not, and it should not be the solution. It should be a part of a solution. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pam. Um, and I'm going on then to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, for the, the, your presentation this morning. Um, Rita, we were on the TV earlier this week, and afterwards, a community um, diabetes specialist nurse contacted me and indicated that he is working in a, a, a team that is 50% down in terms of vacancies and that they can't um, attract others because it takes an additional three years of training and that they can only go as far as band seven. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on the fact that it does take those additional three years to become a specialist nurse, especially when you can only go so far in terms of wage. And also, what impact does that have actually in terms of frontline services for the patients? That's the first question, thank you. Okay, so um, I take it he's talking about the um, the SPQ, the Specialist Practice Qualification for District Nursing. Um, and we are very clear that that, that that needs to stay. We are very clear that within district nursing, a district nurse must have the SPQ. Um, it takes a year, I think, to do that, but there is a level of experience <clears throat> that you have to have before you do it. But I'll, I'll put you through to, uh, put you on to Fiona, because Fiona's got, She's a district nurse by background, so if you want, if you want to answer that. Thank you, Rita. And I think maybe, Paula, just to clarify, it was in relation to a diabetic community specialist. Yes. Um, right across uh, Northern Ireland in the Trusts, we are having huge problems with the diabetic specialist nurse from the point of view. And yes, it does take a, a year uh, on the back of their general training. But there are very few uh, diabetic specialist nurses uh, regionally. It's been acknowledged and are looking at um, you know, how to fund and how to try and support uh, this team of nurses. But I know right across there are huge absences because of the 
massive caseloads that these specialist nurses are carrying and um, they're, they're trying to do their uh, prescribing on, on top of uh, managing the caseloads. They're not even getting the time release to do that. So they're doing their prescribing and other associated courses to, to supplement and support their diabetic um, workings, but they're not getting the time out to do it. So they have to lift the caseload at the end of the day. So there's a huge amount of absence right across uh, the trust in this uh, area. And I suppose what's also happening unfortunately is because there is uh, seen to be a lack of ability to get into GP uh, practices and because GPs are saying they're working in different ways there are inappropriate referrals going into the community diabetic uh, specialist teams to pick up because what they're saying is they can't access the GP surgeries etc so this is having a huge impact on the diabetic specialists on other uh, specialist services within the community as well as the district um, teams as well, they're picking up GP work that normally wouldn't be theirs. And at the end of the day, what is said is uh, that you can't refuse it. And unlike the acute side, um, community, whether they're district, diabetic, or, or whatever specialty that they're in the community, there's no ceiling on their caseload. So they can't call capacity, they can't close beds in community, whatever area that is, unlike the acute side. So di community diabetes is a huge uh, area that we need investment in and to look for supporting and having more in the team. And yes, in regards to uh, career development, it's very, very difficult to, to career develop on the clinical side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Fiona. Could, could I come in on that um, as well, Rita, the summary? Um, in, in terms of undertaking specialist practice courses, um, it's a two-year a two course, um, and the nurse will continue to work whilst undertaking the course. Um, as Fiona has said, you then have responsibility for a large uh, cohort of patients and you are the expert clinician in their care and the patients rely very heavily on us to coordinate their care as well. Um, also, as Fiona has said, because of the pressure across the whole service at the minute in terms of providing a COVID response and a non-COVID response, when a specialist nurse is redeployed to work in another area, that means that you immediately have to downturn their service and therefore there is nobody there to help support the patients, particularly with long-term conditions when they become unwell. And that inevitably means because of the changes in the way uh, uh, primary care within the GP surgeries are being delivered, these patients will inevitably end up um, having more exacerbations of their condition and ending up in, in our ED departments. So the ramifications roll out. Um, the, the, the district nurse that contact, or the diabetic nurse that contacted you and feels they're, they're, they can't get beyond a band seven is because to, to be able to get an advanced uh, practice post, you then have to undertake an advanced practice masters, and that's an additional two years. And those posts, whilst we would dearly love to develop them, are few and far between. Thank you, ladies. I think that's where the, the, the additional couple of years that he was talking about uh, um, was mentioned. Uh, yes. the, the second part around district nursing element to it, and, and again, it's in the backdrop of pro uh, providing care for people in their homes so they don't end up in ED or, or in secondary care. And that was some um, concerns that have been raised past about how long the recruitment process can take through BSO. And I'm just wondering, were they isolated cases that people have come to me about, or are you finding processes are excessively long. Thank you. Um, I think it, it's well known that BSO, um, we, we have raised our issues with BSO um, recruitment and the length of time it takes um, for, for a long time, for uh, three or four years now. Um, our managers are coming to us saying, you know, I've had people on, on my books you know, names of people ready to start and we can't get them started. And we have brought that to, um, we've brought that through the trade union side partnerships to the, the employers and to the Department of Health. Um, and we have asked that to be looked at urgently because we cannot have, you know, nurses on one end not able to cope in the hospitals um, and in the community and the other end have 
have people sitting waiting to start jobs. We, we, we just can't have that. It's unacceptable. Um, so we have asked that there be a, a, a focus put on making recruitment and retention, uh, making recruitment of staff as quick as it possibly can be. Um, as yet, I, I don't know that that's as good as it needs to be. I mean, it should be quick. It should not take three or four months to recruit a nurse into a vacant position when when we have a nurse there to do it. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. I think that's something. Um, quickly, um, Chair, can you, can you one last. Please, thank you. Uh, that's in relation to the job evaluation. You said that the nurse in your um, paper, the Nursing and Midwifery Task Force, are looking at the job uh, evaluation process with no time it comes to date. Are you aware, um, have you been given an um, answer as to why it has taken so long for these processes to take place? Thank you. Um, in a word, COVID. We have been told because the department is in business continuity, none of those groups have, have set. Um, now, the, the, um, I'm going to be chairing the workforce stabilisation group with the, the director um, of workforce, and that we hope that's going to start next week. But we have, you know, constantly raised our concerns that none of the nurse and midwifery task group report groups, there's to be three of them, have, have started, and, and COVID is the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Jerry? Thank you. Thanks for the presentation this morning. Um, the first question is probably for Fiona around pay um, and the fact that there's been no engagement around pay, um, if I heard you correctly, from the department is, is very concerning. I mean, obviously, um, the paper states that RCA are calling for a 12.5% pay uplift. Um, and I think that's the, the bare minimum that you deserve. Um, I would like you just to maybe speak the fact that a 3% offer um, is seemingly will be uh, imposed by the minister and the executive. And to me, that sounds like a really insulting offer, a uh, insulting message, rather. The nurses, health and social care workers, um, the fact that inflation is above uh, 3%, as you well know, fuel is up by 20 and 30%, uh, so a 3% um, is quite insulting. Um, so maybe just to speak to that, and if I picked up the, the briefing correctly, I think um, there's a possible consultative ballot, um, if I've read that correctly, uh, and if that takes place, certainly I will be fully supporting RCN uh, in that. So maybe just to address the concerns about about pay and uh, what, the, what impact that's having on your on your members, please. Thank you. Yes, um, we are asking for a 12.5 fully funded um, pay award, and at the moment it's 3% has been offered uh, elsewhere in England and Wales and Scotland. We know a 4% uh, award offer was made. Um, as I said earlier, that does not reflect the real, uh, in real terms, the, the, the loss that we have incurred over the last 10 years or more. It's 15%. And when you take inflation into consideration, this 3% award, if it's a awarded to nursing here in Northern Ireland and other healthcare professionals, uh, it'll be a real-time cut. It's actually when you, you take the inflation. So, as I said, when we went on to the uh, industrial action and strike uh, last year, uh, that was because uh, nursing here said enough was enough. We are being asked uh, more and more, and the reality is we, we, we can't recruit, we can't retain staff because, you know, as uh, Rita and others have pointed out, uh, basically we're not been supported but we, we don't get the training we don't get the the time to, to do what we're meant to do and more has been asked and, and less has been given so uh, we will be going to our members once uh, an award offer has been made by the uh, minister and executive and if that is uh, the three percent award that has been offered elsewhere then we will as the rcn go to the membership and consult with them as uh, we have right across the rest of the uk and see what our membership uh, want us to do, but uh, and if that leads to an indicative ballot uh, and goes down the line again um, into industrial action or strike, well, unfortunately, then that's the route we'll have to go. But no nurse, and, and you know, let's be very clear: when we stood back in 2019 and 20 on uh, picket lines, no nurse. It was with a very, very hard, uh, heavy heart that we stood on those picket lines in the cold and rain. But we did it for patient care. We did it for because it was about safe staff and it was about quality of care. And we knew under our registration as NMC's uh, registrants that we were not providing safe care and the quality of care that our patients, the public of Northern Ireland, deserve. And therefore, we were doing it and advocating for the patients 
conditions that we care for every day. So yes, uh, we await, as I said, we have written three times to the First and Deputy First Ministers requesting an urgent uh, meeting to discuss about uh, the pay award and to discuss about safe staffing. And as yet, um, we've been given a response that they're given a due consideration, and that's since the start of uh, September. And that response in itself is... Um, felt by the membership as not taking on board what nursing and other health professionals have done over the last year um, in regards to, to COVID. Although I will stress that the pay is not about the response to COVID and shouldn't be seen. It's about the overall roles and responsibilities and the work that nursing and health professionals have done for years and not getting remunerated accordingly. Thanks, Fiona. And I suppose many people feel that, you know, uh, take your point about these are historical issues around pay, but many people feel if you can't pay nurses properly now, you know, hopefully towards the tail end of a pandemic, you know, when will they be paid? So I share your concerns and also uh, addressing the, the kind of myths that 3% is an increase. I think that was an important point uh, to make. Um, I think I've only limited time, so um, I want to move on just to ask the Chair touched upon it. Uh, and non-nursing duties um, and I think the, the paper uh, I think connects that to efficiency savings as well so my reading of it my understanding of, of nurses is they're doing a lot of non-nursing duties obviously they're, they're phoning up uh, they're doing other admin work uh, which is important work um, but to me that kind of speaks to the fact that there's been a, an assault on um, staff that are not seen as frontline but are frontline um, so maybe uh, could you speak to the impact on, on nurses on a, on a daily basis, how the extra workload they're in, in reality not, not supposed to be doing, but are doing, how that affects yeah. them? Uh, if you could speak to that, that would be useful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so we did a survey of our members just about two weeks ago and asked them, because obviously if you've got a, um, a, a resource that is um, squeezed, then that resource should only be doing what only that resource can do, i.e. nurses should be doing nursing uh, duties and looking after patients. However, it is shocking that when we went out to find out, we have recruited nurses from India and the Philippines at great cost and brought them over. They're very highly skilled people and we have them washing empty beds. We have them washing lockers. We have them run into pharmacy to get drugs. We have them run into the canteen because meals haven't come on time. Um, the, the amount of, of, of things that are taking patients or nurses away from patients because, as you rightly said, um, over a, a decade or so, there was a, a, a you know, cost savings and cost savings had to come out of each of the, the trusts and nobody sat down that I can see and said, you know, what are the what are the consequences of cutting these people? Um, what are the consequences of cutting the numbers of um, domestics and cater and assistants and porters and um, ward clerks and, and all of those things? It was done with, with no regard, I think, to what impact that has on other professions. So, for example, we have specialist nurses who maybe spend a third of their time trying to get patient records. They have no admin support, so they spend maybe some of their time doing um, notes, phoning for appointments. Uh, you know, it, the list is endless. And what we have said is, if we have such a scarce resource of nursing, then we should be focusing on, on nursing and looking after patients. And so, I mean, it would be my view that every ward should have a ward clerk. Every ward should have a ward housekeeper. Those are roles that do not need nurses. Um, but if we don't have those people, then nurse time is, is spread so thinly that the patients end up not getting the care that they need because the nurses are, are, are having to do all the other jobs as well. So it is really important to us that that is given, um, I suppose, the importance that it should be, and it is looked at very quickly. However, when we went to the trade union partnership, Two weeks ago, our d directors of HR, and I have to say, they have taken that, that on board and have looked at what they can do to reduce non-nursing duties, but they're finding difficulty recruiting the people that we need, the porters and the domestics and the and the, um, <laughs> the uh, ward clerks, etc. So there seems to be an absolute dearth of um, people out in, in Northern Ireland who, who want to work in the health service. And, you know, there's probably one reason for that, and it's the pay right across the board. Um, the pay is not, um, you, you can be a healthcare assistant in a, in a nursing home and, and earn um, minimum wage, or you can go and work 
in one of the retail outlets or Tesco or wherever else and, and get more money for no responsibility or less responsibility. So, you know, it is not the health service is not an attractive place to work at the minute. And we really need to deal with that. Thank you. Thanks. Chair, sorry, could I come in there, please? Yes, go ahead. Uh, briefly, Fiona, yeah. Certainly. Thank you. Just briefly on the back of what Rita has said, that um, with the restructuring in uh, community services for district teams, they were one, the only profession uh, or discipline that did not receive uh, admin support or very, very little compared to all other disciplines that have. And secondly, to say that we have right across the system um, ward clerks, uh, admin who are agency for five, six, seven years and not given a, a permanent contract. Uh, so th it's about the cost, it's about the investment uh, in that resource should be more permanent uh, for the, the trust and also for the staff that's involved. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And moving then to Alan. Go ahead, Alan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Rita, uh, uh, early in your presentation, uh, you referred to uh, the attitude of some management towards nurses in, in relation to being asked to do other duties uh, and been sort of told, yeah, well, you know where the door is if you don't like it. Um, I find that uh, quite disgraceful uh, that that attitude would prevail uh, from management. Is it, uh, are you referring to isolated instances or is this endemic uh, across the, uh, the whole nursing situation? Uh, it, it would be hard to say. I think we there are enough um, instances of it for it to concern us. Um, it, it doesn't fail to be isolated. There are some fa fabulous managers out there. Don't get me wrong. And I know in the, in the middle of the of the COVID pandemic response, managers were really pushed between a rock and a hard place, and they were trying to do their very best. So there's absolutely no doubt about that. And we know that there had to be some um, redeployment of staff. We know that it had to happen. But it's how it happens is the issue for us. You know, so some of our members came in tears just and said, I'm being redeployed, for example, to an intensive care unit. And I don't know how to do that. I, you know, I don't feel confident or competent to work in that area. And when they tried to, to say that to some of the managers, they said, well, basically, you know, if you don't like it, you know what to do. Um, other ones were told, well, you're going to have to do it or you'll be disciplined. That is not the way to treat people who have genuine issues and concerns. So what I say to you is it's, it's not endemic. I don't believe it's endemic, but I do believe that it happens more often than it should. And we would call out any of those poor management practices because at the end of the day, you know, those people will go, those staff will go and they'll move somewhere else to where they're going to be treated properly. I presume, really, then, that you know, if it is isolated, individuals uh, within your profession have reported these incidents to you. Um, is there a complete process in place where an individual employee uh, can take a, take a complaint uh, and ask for it to be investigated? And have you, uh, has the Royal College uh, supported uh, nurses in taking uh, that sort of asking for a disciplinary investigation? into that attitude because it really is it wouldn't be tolerated in the private sector for sure it would end up in the tribunal so i'm just wondering uh, you know why why do we accept it uh, in nursing and, and not take the, the necessary complaints procedures and use them I suppose there's two answers to that. Um, we have what we we the, the member themselves have to take the case if that makes sense. So if they want to take a, a case of of bullying or harassment, they have to do that. And we'll support them. What we have done is we have spoken to some of the trust directors and said, you know, this is totally unacceptable, and and try to make sure this doesn't happen again because there is a, still a culture of fear if people speak up and go and make formal complaints or whatever that. That, that they could be, you know, um, made, their lives could be made difficult uh, in the future. So so we, we, we try very hard to support our staff, but what we try to do is just call out the bad behaviours when we see them. And, and I do want to say there are some fabulous managers out there. So this isn't an anti-management. This is about recognising where we see uh, bad behaviours that they do need to be called out. And yes, we... Do you have, there is a formal route, but you have to go formally through the trust um, and take case against the manager themselves. 
Reid, I think the answer in that in the second question was going to be about the redeployment. Did you feel it was necessary and so forth uh, in the midst of the, the pandemic? Yeah. I sort of have answered my question in that. But, yeah. uh, uh, and you, you feel it's not the ethos of it, it's but more or less the way it was implemented that you would have issue with. How do you feel it could have been done better? Um, you know, I think, you know, there is something about... Um, First of all, I think they should have asked for volunteers, not conscripts. Um, and and then there has to be something around, you know, as re as registered nurses, we are registered and we have a, a, a PIN number and we have to work to a code. And if you feel that you don't have the competence to work in an area, it is your duty to say that. Now, what I would say is you can't refuse to become competent, but you have to identify where you're not competent. And there should have been better training and better supervision and better support from senior managers in terms of when people were redeployed. And I have to say, some places did it really well and some places did it really badly. Um, and, you know, we hopefully we are learning lessons, but we're still hearing about people being told you know, you're being redeployed um, and that that's, you know, you have no choice in the matter, you're going and that's it. Um, so, you know, we, we, we need to learn the lessons from what happened in the middle of a pandemic and make sure we don't make those mistakes again because it has had a very detrimental impact on the health and well-being of some of our nurses. And we, and we have lost nurses because of it. That's the final question, and uh, Rita, we talked there about the aggression that nurses and staff are facing, particularly in accident emergency departments, and you can sort of, which you do not condone it, you can sort of understand the frustrations of people waiting for long times, and but unfortunately the nurse is the first line that uh, these people attack. But uh, I'm more concerned about what I hear about aggression and, and say, in acute wards. Now, I can understand in the accident emergency, you can put on security and, 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 and so forth and, and deal with people maybe, but it's very hard to throw somebody out onto the street as well if they are misbehaving. But in, in terms of uh, uh, misbehaviour or aggressive behaviour in, in acute wards, I think may, may have been the private meeting with you. You told us about even injuries being sustained, which is totally unacceptable yeah. by nurses. What, what's the answer to that within wards? What do you feel? I, I know uh, uh, more more security on, on the accident and emergency uh, departments. Yes. But how do you how do you deal with aggression uh, satisfactorily within acute wards? What, what's the answer? I mean, you can't expel somebody and tell them, look, you know, you're out. Uh, so how, how do you deal with it? What's what, what's the answer? I'm going to let Anne Marie come in here because Anne Marie works in the acute wards within the matter. So I will let Anne Marie um, thank you answer that one. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it is a very real problem um, and it's absolutely terrifying for nurses and the, the whole clinical team if you're on the ward and, and a patient um, or their, well, their relatives. With the restriction in visiting, it's not so much uh, a, a problem at the minute. But there's a lot of delirium associated with COVID. But in the non-COVID wards, um, we also, everything is made more difficult and complex uh, when you have patients maybe with serious mental health issues or um, drug or alcohol uh, addiction. So the workplace be becomes a, a, a much more stressful environment. We then have to um, try and make sure we have security at hand. We have to try and get um, a one-to-one -one nursing arrangement. Um, very often that will be made possibly through agency, and the agency staff may turn up and not want to, to do that work on that particular shift. But it makes everything um, much more stressful and heightened for the whole ward environment. Other patients are worried and afraid, and it, it then just becomes nigh on impossible to be able to deliver the quality of care to all the patients on the ward that you want to do. Is it a new phenomenon, this, or is this something that you've had to face for, well, you know, forever? I mean, um, we, we've always had to deal with it to a certain degree, but it has definitely um, escalated over the last few years. And, um, and it does, it, it's a, very, it's a re very real fear that nurses can have coming on duty. And it's also then, if you have a patient who is very difficult to manage, 
it's hard then to get them moved on from that particular ward environment. That, that, that gets to be um, very, very challenging as well um, to try and find a facility that can, can manage their ongoing care when they're over their acute phase. Could, could I, if you, if you don't mind, could I make a comment um, about senior managers and directors? Because every day of the week I sit on the respiratory and critical care hub where across the region uh, with the, the five trusts, they would try and work out where there's ICU capacity, both for COVID patients, non-COVID patients, and what the pressure is within respiratory and the need for Sorry? Uh, so the need for um, uh, respiratory enhanced support. And the directors across the trust have to make the most impossible um, decisions around having to cancel surgery and who's going to get the ICU bed for the time critical cancer. So I wouldn't want to walk in their shoes either. They have a very difficult job. They do understand the pressure and the massive ask when they're having to redeploy staff and downturn services. And many of them are nurses themselves and, and members. So. The, the whole system is under this time bomb of pressure to be able to deliver this un, unsustainable demand that we're facing at the minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's hugely concerning. Okay. Chair, okay. could I please add a comment? Yes, briefly, please, Fiona. Yeah. I just want, thank you, Chair. I would just like to come back about to the issue about violence and aggression. We have to remember it's not just the acute side. We have to remember that our colleagues in the community areas are also facing um, verbal and physical abuse. They don't have the same backup as you do have in ED or the uh, medical wards or, or surgical, whatever wards it is. They don't have, in a lot of places, uh, lone working devices that would support them the way they do across the rest of the UK. We're told that if they require them, have to do a risk assessment after they have had the encounter, which is a, a, a bit of a, a reverse uh, situation. But also, you know, they're been faced and still have to continue to go in. And what we find with verbal and physical uh, abuse in the community with staff is that when teams continually are told they must go in because the person is part of the caseload and requires a uh, care, that uh, if that, that team gets tired, that team is stood down and the neighbouring team are then sent in and they do the, the uh, face on with the verbal and physical abuse that's encountered there and it takes a very protracted time before it's actually dealt with it's dealt with with letters and um, the patients the families then contact the mlas to say that you know that they're, they're not happy with the situation so it's not just and we need to remember the focus shouldn't just always be that violence and aggression is happening in our acute side it's happening out there in the community and they are lone workers who have nobody to support them and are very very alone and have had uh, real encounters where their life has been in danger injured um, and that's the trauma and the the stress that that uh, causes and in some cases as a result of uh, abuse ongoing and not dealt with appropriately by the trust staff have left uh, the um, district areas also just in relation to the acute where there is delirium as Anne marie has alluded to uh, um, with patients where there should be and this goes back to our safe staff and levels there isn't the right number of staff on those wards where there should be to allow for one to one um, supervision and observation of patients where there is noted uh, delirium and increased uh, delirium with the patients that's admitted. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And then I just finally want to check with Jonathan. Jonathan, your hand was raised, has, has gone down, but I want to check. Do you have a question there, Jonathan? No, Chair. Thanks. My question was answered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so there's there's a couple of uh, issues just that I wanted to pick up quickly that came and that emerged through the briefing. And you had mentioned, Rita, that um, the retention strategy that you'd asked for, uh, and I think it was referred to as better late than never. But that's in the that's in the uh, in the office of the chief nursing officer. What's your uh, take on how disruptive potentially the change over now could be in terms of that work or indeed any other work? Um, well, we have raised our concerns about the loss of our chief nurse, um, uh, which is imminent. It's the end of the month. Um, 
we are very concerned that our professional lead is leaving and as yet there is no uh, nothing put in place and all of the work that the, the chief nurse has done um, around all the nurse demography task group, the the um, delivering care, the um, enhancing critical framework, all of the work that she has done is, I, I would hope, um, will not will, will not lie undone until somebody else comes into place. This is all critical work that our profession needs to be. Um, uh, moved on and moved on very quickly. COVID, as I've said, has already stopped some of the, the fundamental work that should have been happening. And um, we are, and, and we have raised, our, the RCN have raised their concerns about what's happening with the chief nurse at the highest level. Um, and, you know, the job description went out last week and we've raised concerns about that again. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and and uh, I have to say that's that's something of, of additional worry on top of all the other things that that we have discussed there. And I think the phrase that was used there around the time bomb of pressure, I think, is 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 hugely relevant here across all of the questions and answers and the presentations. Um, just finally, for me, then I was looking to check in terms of what efforts and work has taken place or is ongoing at the minute to engage with yourselves on workforce planning for the nursing training and I know you've identified issues there within your within your briefing around pressures on placements as well as as uh, university placements but is there ongoing work with yourselves to plan for how many health nurses health visitors district nurses um, intensive care unit nurses is that type of detailed planning going on in relation to yourselves to see how many additional training places we need or can facilitate beyond the 300 that were identified in NDNA not not with us no not at that level um what what we what we know is as i've said the delivering care identifies what we need um i am unsure as to where the actual planning how how what that would look on a spreadsheet for example as if you were to look at for the next five years um, how many nurses are we going to need to uh, train? How many nurses do we know we're going to leave because they're at, at that age? And as you know, we're an aging, an aging profession. Um, so I don't know where that very detailed work is happening. I don't know if it's happening at all. Um, there, you know, there are concerns for us about who who has the um, the remit, and who has the authority, and who has the responsibility and accountability to do that. Very, very detailed work. I, I, I'm not sure if it's actually happening. If it is, I don't know about it. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. And that's 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 also because I think there is that level of urgency has been in and and. Uh, criticality has been in the system for some time so I think it's really important that we we drill into um, what that what is happening with that because at the end of the day all of the other problems around waiting lists around responding and coping with COVID those all depend on staff if you if we don't have staff we don't have solutions and we don't have nurses we don't have the we don't have the capacity to deal with the health and social care issues that we are facing so I, yeah, want to I mean, thank our, our patients deserve better. That's that's all I will say. Our patients, our public, deserve better than what they're getting at the minute. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Rita. I think I think our our public, the, the public deserve better, and I think staff deserve better. I think staff deserve to be working in an environment where they're properly respected, properly supported, um, properly staffed, and uh, I, I think we need to we need to put an urgent focus on that. So listen, I want to thank you all very much for your attendance here this morning and for your contributions. I want to reiterate my condemnation of acts of aggression towards any health and social care worker that's out there in, in a ward or in a district or in a community setting. Um, and it, to me, it's absolutely unacceptable that they would be uh, subjected to violence or aggression, whether that be overt or or less overt uh, and I, I know that a lot of that goes on as well where there's kind of what what is referred to sometimes as microaggressions but I think that's totally unacceptable and we should have a zero tolerance of, of that type of behavior so um, I want to thank each and every one of you Fiona Rita Anne Marie and Connie for appearing today I want to wish you all the very best in the time ahead and I would like you to extend our uh, appreciation to the members who you represent for everything they have done and everything they continue to do on all of our behalfs. So, Goramila Mayagov.
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, there's, there's a, a, members, an awful lot of, of huge. I don't think we have we have done it even full justice today in terms of the level and extent of concerns that are out there. I was going to suggest maybe that that clerk maybe that if we look at within the, the detailed briefing and there are issues there we didn't really get to on some of them. Could you extract from that a series of questions that that we should go back to the department with? And they also, if there are any things uh, additional emerging from the briefing there. And maybe certainly at that to members, just to be sure that we have a full a full readout of the key questions emerging from this session. Would members be content with that approach? Ten, chair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Chairman, uh, I just Chairman is yes. Alan. If I could come in. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't get to, to ask the, the questioner. Fiona raised at the end of the presentation. Um, something that maybe we hadn't picked up during the, the presentation about the aggression with community nurses, and when you think about that, they are really they, they're the most exposed because they, they have just absolutely nobody to turn to uh, if they find themselves in a, in a, in a particularly in a, a in an awkward position and, and in and an enclosed space, somebody's home. Um, I, I wanted to maybe ask Fiona what did she feel was the solution there. You know, so it, it, uh, I, I'd like to maybe find out that what, what is it the, the college feel is the is the way to protect our community nurses and community staff better. Okay, so separately, will committee members agree with that? That we ask the college to advise us of what they think would assist in dealing with and addressing some of those issues. Agree, yeah. Chair. Agreed. Yes, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Just following on from Alan's um, comment there, I suppose it links very much into the safe staffing legislation, and I appreciate the pressures on the Department of Health at the minute in terms of the legislative programme. However, I think that um, the department should begin consulting and engaging around what safe staffing legislation would look like, because I, I would imagine that a lot of that will link again into the community um, element of nursing and other um, services develop, are delivered in the home. Um, and what are you suggesting there, Paula? I, we have, well, we have, I'm, we have well, asked. I'm going to suggest if we can ask the department how they are preparing um, for engaging, or whether they're going to start engaging around what safe staffing legislation will look like um, within this mandate, because they've indicated they won't actually get the legislation um, started until the next mandate. So it's really the priority work that I'm asking for details on. Yep, and thank you for that clarity. Yeah, members are content with that. Yeah, and we have also uh, we also have a current request with the department to outline their their uh, legislative uh, scheduling at present. So we will will await that as well. Okay, members, I'm going to take a short break there, sure. just a comfort break, please. If we could come back at 11:05, and we'll resume there. Thank you. And the chamber. That's nice, chair. Okay, thank you, members. So we'll resume our uh, meeting then. And Pam, you, you had a comment or an issue there that you wanted to raise in relation to the RCN presentation? Yes, thanks, Chair. It was uh, more to agree with the um, other members' comments and also to ask it, you know, should we be writing to um, the department to, to seek clarity on what's going to happen um, when the chief nursing officer does leave her post and um, how quickly can she be replaced and what does that uh, mean in terms of impacting on um, all of the good work that has gone on before by the chief nursing officer? Yep, members agreed with that. Yes, seek that clarity, yes, thank you. Okay, members, thank you for that. And we're moving on then to um, item six. So members are aware that the Health and Care Bill was introduced in Westminster on the 6th of July. The Minister informed the Committee on the 8th of July that there are four provisions in this Bill that require the legislative consent of the Assembly. Um, department officials are here today to brief the Committee on the four separate aspects of the Bill that require legislative consent. I refer members to the briefing paper at tab 6.1 and to the members' correspondence at tab 6.2 and 6.3 of your pack. Um, I would suggest that we take the LCM in order. So we will take the short briefing. We'll, we'll take each in order just for clarity. So we'll take the short briefing on the international health care arrangements first, and then allow members to ask questions on that before moving on to the second LCM. So bear in mind, members, before them to get through, I thought it would be a uh, you know, difficult if we took the four briefings and then asked questions around them all. So we'll do them one at a time so we can just keep retaining that, that focus 
Um, and I just want to check then, has the Legislative Consent mo me Memorandum been laid? No, Chair, I've had no notice of it being laid so, in this envelope. So it hasn't been laid, so we don't need to arrive at a decision today, but we can take the briefings today? Okay. Okay, and uh, so, Members, in, in light of that, then, I'll go to, I'll, I'll welcome to our, uh, the, from the panel, I will welcome Patricia Quinn Duffy, who's within the Pharmaceutical Directorate in Healthcare Policy, and I'll ask Patricia to brief us on the provisions relating to the international healthcare arrangements. Uh, Patricia, if you could give us a short briefing, um, hopefully around five minutes, if, if possible, um, and then we will go to members' questions on this particular, um, this particular element. Thank you, Patricia. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. Um, just in, and thank you for the committee for speaking to us today. And yes, you have outlined that um, the LCMs have not been laid yet, and we are still working on those. And we are um, working to a very tight timeline that has been set by the Department of Health and Social Care. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, to brief the committee. Um, I have a, a short introduction on all of the um, the LCMs. Would you prefer that I did them individually and then opened for questions, Chair? Yes. Yes, do, okay. do them individually, Patricia, and then we'll do the questions, because I think it is potentially to get uh, quite confusing if we take the yes. four together. So do, we're going to do each of them, each of them in turn. Individually. In a, short, okay. in a shorter, briefer session as well. Bear that in mind. All right. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, with the international health care arrangements, um, the Health and Care Bill seeks to amend the Health Care EEA and Switzerland's Arrangements Act of 2019 to enable the Secretary of State to implement comprehensive bilateral health care arrangements with the rest of the world. This will enable uh, the UK to pay for treatments outside the UK and facilitate the ne necessary data processing um, by expanding the scope of the Act to countries, territories and international organisations outside the EU, EEA and Switzerland. The draft clauses will allow the Secretary of State to make regulations to implement the international arrangements by amending regulation making powers at Section 2 of the Healthcare EEA and Switzerland's Arrangements Act. Having UK wide legislation for international healthcare arrangements will ensure a consistent framework for the negotiation and implementation of those arrangements. However, international relations are accepted, but Health is a devolved matter, and any future regulations taken forward that would have a devolved implication are subject to a statutory duty to consult before those regulations are made. This duty is underpinned by a memorandum of understanding, which sets out the mechanisms by which the UK nations will work together to deliver on international health care arrangements from negotiation to implementation. Um, officials are currently working on a revised MOU to set out um, in further detail um, how this will work and how they will work together to develop and implement any future international health care agreements. Chair, that's a very brief, short um, introduction to the health, international health care arrangements. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. That revised MOU, when can we expect to, to see that? Um, Chair, at the moment, it's still in the very early stages um, of being revised. There is one that is there at the moment, um, which was uh, agreed prior to the Assembly returning. Um, the MOU, we are working very diligently on it, and I would expect that by the end of the year there should be an agreement. Um, Considering um, experience of working with the um, DHSC on text for MOUs and previously, it does take some time to get it fully agreed um, within the four nations. Okay, and just as was, as was uh, just as by way of a comment around the statutory duty to consult, which is fair enough, and that's okay, but that will be replacing the ability to to make the to make the legislation so i think in that context we just need to it's a second phrase almost it's not really it's a mitigation if you if you like but anyway yes um is there any impact in relation to this particular lcm in relation to cross-border health care here on the island of ireland no because um the 
the north south cooperation is is under the good friday agreement under the the belfast agreement and those are not involved within this um international relations so the northern ireland can still work with ireland to have um any north south cooperation that is appropriate for us to to do so no it, it doesn't have any impact Okay, thank you. And would this LCM impact the, fu the, the ability of a future health minister to enter into deeper or closer arrangements with any particular area or state? Uh, does, it, does it impact that? Because international arrangements are um, uh, an accepted matter, the minister wouldn't be able to come to agreements with states. However, it doesn't, um, it doesn't work in terms of um, contracts with providers. Um, we have uh, the, the department and the minister has um, powers under the uh, 1979 order, which allows us to purchase and procure um, health care outside Northern Ireland. So, the, for example, the extra contractual referrals would still be able to go ahead with other um, in other countries, so that we can purchase still health care. It also means that we would be able to enter contracts with providers. But it wouldn't be with states, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of the data processing aspects of the arrangements, how would those comply with GDPR, and or or which would take precedence? In the um, Healthcare EEA and Switzerland Arrangements Act, there is a section five um, sets out the uh, data processing arrangements, and they would be in compliance with GDPR. Um, this is particularly for planned care, where a patient is having um, care which is specifically planned under uh, an international arrangement. This would have been what, under the European arrangements, would have been known as an S2. Um, so there would be data sharing between Northern Ireland and the UK and between UK and a third country. Um, <clears throat> so that arrangement is all in the, in the HESA Act itself. Okay, and uh, what are the current rules for access and cure healthcare in Europe, in, our, in the EU, more particularly? Um, they're under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and they are under the Social Security Protocol in in that uh, agreement. The arrangements are almost completely uh, the same as under the Regulation 883 on the coordination of Social Security. So for EU countries, there is full man maintenance of um, the healthcare cooperation and reciprocal healthcare. Um, what the UK residents would have to do is to apply for a GHIC, a global health insurance card, rather than an EHIC. Um, so that it opens up for everyone. It also has a continuation of the S2 planned care route, and it also has arrangements for posted workers, frontier workers, and retiring to other nations and retiring back to the UK and having your arrangements paid for by the state that you live in. Um, negotiations are still ongoing with um, the EFTA countries and Switzerland around future arrangements there, um, and all pre um, end of uh, transition, people are covered by the uh, withdrawal agreement and the EFTA and Swiss agreements at that point. Okay, and if if someone doesn't have a GHEC uh, in place before they travel, what, what happens there or what arrangements are in place? Or has it been widely enough, in your view, communicated to the public that that system has fundamentally the changed? since Brexit? Um, the, the arrangements are the same. The applications will be the same. I think that um, the applications for an EHIC or GHIC um, haven't changed as such. Um, the place that you apply for them is the same. I don't think enough people uh, know about um, being able to get a um, replacement certificate known as a PCR. Um, so if you don't have an EHIC or a GHIC uh, when you travel, and you end up needing to use one, you can apply for a sort of an immediate replacement certificate, which will allow you to get the healthcare that you need paid for by the UK. I, I don't think that is as widely as known as it should be. 
Um, but GHIC and EHIC will be the same. Um, and I think if someone knows about an EHIC and goes to apply, they will just be directed through to the GHIC um, application. Well, can you commit to addressing or taking that back for addressing that issue about communicating that? I think as travel yes. becomes more um, more uh, possible um, as mm -hmm. it is at the present time, then that becomes a great, bigger and bigger issue. Yes, I can, Chair. Yes. Thank you. I make um, a commitment to do that. Okay. Thank you, um, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, there's been concern about the, the bill generally, um, the, the full sort of content of it, and I want to know. Um, I'd like to ask rather um, how that impacts on, on people here. So, like United Union, uh, I've said that this bill is a recipe for more privatisation and cronyism in England. I want to know how that affects us here. Um, they've stated that it will invite uh, private companies to make further inroads into the health service. Um, there's also uh, a question around the Secretary of State's powers to interfere, uh, as I understand, it, over the head of healthcare workers, um, if not uh, chief executives or, or heads of trusts. Um, so th those are some concerns that, that are being expressed generally about the bill. Um, so I want to know just if, if there's been any discussion around that, uh, any clarity around that. And, and I think if I heard you correctly, you said that uh, this is about agreement with providers, but not states. And, and to me, that would indicate sort of private providers. So um, there's just alarm bells um, signal in my head about it. So uh, just a bit of uh, clarity around that, I think, would be would be useful. Um, thank you for the question. I, unfortunately, because I'm dealing specifically with the international healthcare arrangements piece, I don't have um, full uh, sort of understanding of the the bill itself. But I can take that away to have um, information sent back to the the committee on the bill itself in general. Um, in terms of the the element that I spoke about, where you be able to purchase. Um, healthcare internationally. The current system that we have is, is an extra contractual referral, which really allows um, the, the Health and Social Care Board in Northern Ireland to buy services that we can't provide in Northern Ireland. Um, if we can't get them within the rest of the UK, we can go further afield. Um, and it's really, rather than privatising, it's, it's trying to manage the um, delivery of care which patients in Northern Ireland need and um, which are potentially not uh, able to deliver um, either in Northern Ireland or even on a, a full Ireland basis, um, potentially because of the rarity of the, the provision of service that is there. Okay, I just appreciate if you could get more information around that because uh, and no disrespect, but if we're being told there's only small aspects of the bill that's affecting us here, but there's a whole gamut of, of areas that are going to impact on the provision of healthcare and you know the opening up of, of uh, the NHS, and I think it has a massive impact on on people here. So if we get a bit of clarity around that, I think that would be the benefit of myself and, and members. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And Patricia, just just uh, just going back on a, on a on a, a related issue you had said there about um, something was a reserved matter, but. So, taking it if health as health is a, as a devolved matter, yes. if the minister for health, for example, and I understand there's a difference between providers and states, but in relation to say if we were looking to do enhanced cooperation with Spain, for example, in health terms, is there anything within this that would prevent a health minister from doing that? There, the international arrangements with the government is an, is a reserved matter. Um, but we would be able to make arrangements with regions or hospitals um, to, to provide services or make he better healthcare cooperation. Um, those are not reserved matter, that's more a um, contractual matter. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? Uh, I had a hand up from Jonathan there, but it's gone down again, so I'll come back to Jonathan. Yes, Thank John, you, Chair. go ahead. Go ahead. Sir, can you hear me yet? Yes. Yeah. So, so I suppose the question I would have in this, and I think most of it seems very, very sensical, um, but in relation to the social burden on research for within the health budget, how, how does granting the national government power to provide for agreements with the rest of the world affect this? Um, the the provision of reciprocal healthcare is managed centrally 
um, by the NHS Business Services Authority on behalf of the UK. They have a budget which is used to pay um, other countries for healthcare provided in that country, um, whether it's under an EHIC, GHIC or S2 or indeed an S1. Um, what that means is that where someone, say for example, arrives in Northern Ireland as a visitor and they're using an EHIC, that cost is absorbed by the health service in Northern Ireland. They then register <clears throat> that healthcare provision through the EHIC system to NHS BSA. They then will reclaim that money back from the other country um, and the trust can claim back 25% of the cost directly under an incentive scheme um, to try and encourage trusts right across the UK to register the use of EHICs and third country um, reciprocal healthcare and nationals. Um, where we probably um, benefit from the reciprocal healthcare is around the use of S2s, which is for planned care. Um, currently, Northern Ireland predominantly uses S2 planned care routes for um, bone marrow transplants to the Republic. And those, we would um, use quite a number of those a year. Um, and in a normal year, rather than a COVID year, there would be between about 15 and 20 um, bone marrow transplants uh, done in the South. Um, those treatments uh, cost about £300,000 each, and they are paid for by a central fund from um, the NHS BSA, rather than out of um, board budget. So there, there, whilst there is a net, uh, there's a deficit in terms of having to absorb the cost of EHICS, there is a benefit in terms of the planned care treatments that are going abroad. Okay, th thank you. And, and that does answer that question. And I suppose just and a, a wee follow up in relation to the consultation which has been carried out. So which professional bodies have been consulted with uh, on the nature of any potential changes uh, to the regulatory framework and specifically ha have senior managers been uh, consulted with? Um, the consultation, I, I don't have the detail here, but I can get that to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. So then we're going to move on to the next, uh, the next second LCM, which is on the Madison's Information System. And Patricia is joined now by David Wilson, who is Senior Principal of DCMO, and um, Karen Simpson, who's the pharmaceutical uh, head of the pharmaceutical directorate or from that pharmaceutical directorate. So I'll just double check with the, uh, yourself, Karen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Chair. Thank and, you. And you're leading the briefing on this, this, in, this, this individual uh, LCM, Karen, yeah. is that right? Okay. Go yes. ahead, please. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Yes, thank you for... Okay, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee today on the health and care bill with particular reference to those provisions of the bill take medicines information systems. It is important to point out at the outset that the health and care bill is being used as a legislative vehicle to make an amendment to the Medicines and Medical Devices Act 2021. The committee will recall they gave support to a legislative consent motion last autumn to be considered by the Assembly for a similar power to establish a medical devices information system. The amendment to the Medicines and Medical Devices Act is to enable NHS Digital to collect a range of information about the use of medicines and their effects in the UK and hold this data in one or more information systems. The MHRA would then be able to use the information held in an information system to establish and maintain comprehensive UK-wide medicines registries. It is also important for the committee to note that it is not the intention to create a registry for all medicines used in the UK. The need for establishing a particular medicines registry will be justified on public health grounds and when alternative approaches to capturing sufficient data are not feasible. The proposal for establishment of a new registry will be presented to the Commission on Human Medicines, which is an independent advisory group to the MHRA, who would issue a formal registry spe specific recommendation if considered essential to support patient safety. The proposed registries will support MHRA's regulatory functions and a UK-wide registry is more robust for pharmacovigilance reasons. This is particularly important with regards to high-risk medicines as there is the potential of having these registries mandatory and the ability to reduce harm will be improved. 
The powers will initially be used to capture the data needed to establish a registry on the use of sodium valproate and other anti-epileptics, as recommended in Baroness Cumberley's report of the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. The committee should also note Clause 85 of the Health and Care Bill also makes technical amendments to Section 19 of the Medicines and Medical Devices Act, dealing with the Medical Devices Information System, which are intended to align with the new provisions for the Medicines Information System, and which will enable NHS Digital to share information they receive, which comes from data linkage to other sources, and to contain commercially sensitive technical information about devices. The Department recognises with these enabling provisions that deal with medicines and medical devices information systems, proper safeguards need to be in place to ensure that regulations to be developed take account of Northern Ireland's legislation in relation to disclosure of information alongside information governance and code of practice on the sharing of patients' identifiable information both for direct care and secondary use. Following discussions with the Department of Health and Social Care, in England at both official and ministerial level, the department is content that no regulations can be taken forward on the medicines information system without the consent of the department, as when regulations are to be made under the new Section 7A in the Medicines and Medical Devices Act for the medicines information system, the department will be the appropriate authority either alone or jointly with the Secretary of State, and therefore the department's consent is necessary. This is in recognition of, of medicines being a devolved matter. Regulations will be also subject to the draft affirmative process in the Assembly, and the Committee will be able to scrutinise these regulations fully before they are debated in the Assembly. The situation is different for the Medical Devices Information System, where the Secretary of State has sole authority as a subject matter of the medical devices as a reserve matter. But the committee will recall last year the devolved administrations negotiated a statutory consultation clause to the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, and no regulations can be made without proper consultation with the devolved administrations. And this means the DAs can legally challenge the Secretary of State if there is a failure to consult properly. Furthermore, all regulations need to be made within the boundaries of data protection legislation, including GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. The Department has provided further details on the Medicines Information System Clause within the Committee's briefing pack to help with their report to the Assembly. And we are here and happy to take any questions you have on these specific provisions. Thank you, Chair, for this opportunity to brief you. Okay, thank you. And, and I think that is welcome clarification around the, the ability of uh, consultation here in terms of, of that. Is, is this a Will this link or, or interact with the European, similar European monitoring systems? And is this being done as a result of us falling out of, of some of those other monitoring systems? Is that the, is that the corpus of it? No, this is purely um, to link with MHRA's um, regulatory function as the UK regulatory body for medicines and medical devices. Okay, and is there any potential impact um, of the MHRA registry on movement of medicines from the EU into the north? Is there any potential impact with that? No, there's no potential impact, Chair, no. Okay, so we have a couple of members indicating at this point. I'm going first of all to Pam and then Paula. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Karen. Um, just one question. I was wanting to ask um, to what extent uh, would Northern Ireland's participation in the Common Medicines Information System across the UK depend not on the um, exercise of powers in this LCM, but the outworking of the, the separate regulatory regimes under the protocol? Um, member, I, I would have to take that one away. I think I would need further advice from our information governance um, colleagues on that, um, unless maybe David has anything on that. Maybe, yeah, are you hearing us there, David? Are you hearing us there, David? David might be having sound problems. I think he sent me a message at one stage. Chair, that's fine. If if, if you want to come back, Karen, that's going on. Yes, yep. yes, no, I, I'll come back. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take that away with me, thanks. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Pam. And moving on then to Paula. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel. My question is in relation to the issue of collecting the information here in Northern Ireland to, to feed into this overall process. And you mentioned the Cumberledge um, review. Um, obviously, there, there's 
that's really focused or that's known very much for the vaginal mesh implants but I would be working with the likes of the the men and women who've had the hernia mesh implants and they have been concerned for many years that the data in terms of those um, devices being put in or the the material being put into people's bodies um, and the side effects is not being collected properly so the point really is are you satisfied that the systems here in Northern Ireland are adequate to collect the information uh, when people feel that procedures have gone wrong and devices have not been um, um, fit for purpose, um, that that could then feed into UK wide and further on. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for your question. Um, well, medical devices, well, it, 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 sit, it sits with David, but I think David might be having sound problems. Um, Obviously, like no no system is perfect, and that is why we are trying, you know, to look at what Cumberbatch has recommended, and to look at these these type of registries for medical device information systems and medicines information systems to make sure where there are gaps in information that that they can be pulled together on a UK wide basis. Um, and for example, like for sodium valproate for the, the medicines information system, the England did, you know, the NHS Digital and MHRA have looked at a registry for sodium valproate, which has um, a danger to pregnant pregnant women for the fetuses. So they have looked at a registry, but it's based on NHS England prescribing the data. So that's why they want to look across all the systems and they don't want to have everybody st every creating new measures where everybody has to then or clinicians have to input separate data they're actually going to look at the data systems that the devolved administrations hold to see what information is there and look at data linkages across and see how then they what improvements what the gaps are and what improvements can be made but again this is all very much about patient safety and making sure that you know going forward that those measures are in place Okay, no, that's that's reassuring, and would like to be kept up to date on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula. And okay, thank you. So we move on now, members, to the third LCM, which is related to professional regulation. We are now joined on the panel by Peter Barber, who is head of the Workforce Policy Development. And uh, Peter, if you could go ahead and brief the meeting on this uh, on this LCM, and then we'll take some questions from members. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, if I may just give some introductory comments to explain, this is a, a provision to really a, an enabling provision to, to enable further action to be taken in due course as part of a wider pro, uh, process of reform of the regulation of healthcare professionals in Northern Ireland. To ex explain that the regulation of healthcare professions, it, professionals is a devolved matter. Uh, but the policy approach uh, which the department takes is to work with the departments across the United Kingdom on a four country basis, uh, reflecting the practical reality that the vast majority of healthcare professions are regulated by regulatory bo bodies which have operate on a UK wide basis. So the likes of the G GDC, the GMC, and the NMC. And therefore, obviously, we want to ensure that there's a consistent approach taken across uh, the wider uh, NHS. So what we're talking about here is impact on the nine UK-wide regulatory bodies, the uh, regu re bodies regulating healthcare professions. So the powers sought through the, uh, this uh, provision um, are part of the process of regulatory uh, reform that has been ongoing since uh, 2017, when there was a UK-wide consultation setting out high-level principles for reform. Uh, these were widely recommended by stakeholders, including in Northern Ireland, and the subsequent joint response of the four UK governments in July 2019 set out plans to modernise the legislation of the UK, nine UK wide regulators, through the Westminster Secondary Legislative Route, which is provided for under Section 60 of the Health Act 1999. So, this measure that's being brought forward uh, supports this UK wide uh, agenda. And just to remind members, uh, the objectives of the reform are to ensure that the level of regulatory oversight of healthcare professionals is proportionate to the risk to the public now and into the future, that the bureaucracy uh, of healthcare regulation is reduced, 
and the that the professions protected in law are the right ones. Uh, Section 60 of the Health Act 1999 provides powers to make change to UK-wide professional regulatory landscape. Uh, so the, any use of the Section 60 order can only extend to Northern Ireland with the consent of the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly. So what this proposed, so Section 60 is a pre-existing uh, uh, a power uh, dating back to 1999 Act, and what this uh, revision being brought forward in the legislative consent motion is to seek to extend the use of that Section 60 power in uh, some specific ways. And those specific ways related to the reform process I outlined are to the power to remove a profession from regulation the power to abolish an individual health and care professional regulator, or the power to amalgamate regulators, uh, and then clarifying the scope of Section 60 to potentially in the future bring senior NHS managers and leaders under the scope of uh, regulation should that subsequently be decided as something that uh, uh, a policy direction uh, that was decided to go down. So really what we uh, this legislative consent motion will be seeking the approval of the Assembly is to extend the Section 60 uh, power, pre-existing power, in this way. But the actual use of any in the, um, actual any measure, any single Section 60 order would be subject to uh, a further process, obviously, of consultation, uh, uh, a, also then a legislative consent motion of the Assembly as well, to the extent that it extends to Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Is that, is that you, Peter? We'll go to yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, first one, I suppose, from me. Um, so it largely focuses on a range of professional bodies to cover, cover across Britain and the North. The Deputy First Minister is concerned that this could result in the North Pharmaceutical Society being wound up and consumed within a wider um, yeah. regulatory body. And myself and the clerk actually did meet with the, with the Pharmaceutical Society in relation to that as well. So is there a potential for that associated loss of input that you would have from that? Is there a potential for that within this LCM? Uh, Chair, thank you for that point, and the Department is very aware of, of that uh, concern. Uh, to be, be clear, the uh, Pharmaceutical Society in Northern Ireland is a statute, is Northern Ireland legislation, the 1976 order. Uh, so there is no question at all of any change being made that is not controlled by the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I think I also would also want to reassure members as well that in respect of the use of any section 60 of the 1990 order of the 1999 Act that extends across the, the UK wide to the extent that it impacts on Northern Ireland's devolved competence, competences, a legislative consent motion of the Assembly has to be uh, uh, granted. So I think, Chair, that we should provide assurance that uh, there will be no arbitrary change in this way that the Northern Ireland Assembly is not fully signed up to. Okay, thank you. And, and more broadly then, beyond that, Peter, what consultation has the Department taken place in relation to this item? Okay, so uh, can I say, Member, uh, as I Chair, first of all, I, I mentioned about this wider reform process. Uh, that is ongoing. So uh, it started back in 2015 by the, uh, the various law commissions of the United Kingdom issued a report, including the Law Commission in Northern Ireland. There was then this UK-wide consultation in 2017. Uh, Northern Ireland was fully involved in that. And I, I know there were meetings held in, locally in Northern Ireland where stakeholders were able to contribute. Uh, and there was a very positive uh, uh, support uh, by stakeholders for the general principles that were set out then subsequently in the government's response uh, to that uh, um, in 2019. So there, this is now taking forward uh, that uh, process. So um, in the sense of the actual implementation of any 
individual element of it, again, that would be subject to further consultation. So, for example, uh, Chair, any change in the regulatory landscape would be, uh, which might be permitted by this widened Section 60 power, would would involve a further consultation with stakeholders, a further legislative process through the Westminster, but also a separate legislative consent motion through, given the devolved um, re re uh, the need to consult uh, and ensure the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly. So there, there's a there is much further consultation to, to be undertaken in this area. But the general um, objectives and principles are ones that stakeholders are very supportive of. Okay, thank you, Peter. And the regulation does, or the briefing states that regulations will be required. Would, would those regulations be through Westminster or through the Assembly or both? Okay, so anything at all that impinges upon the uh, devolved the, the competence of the uh, the uh, assembly will require a legislative consent motion. So, to the extent then that if there are future changes being taken forward under the section 60 uh, um, uh, process at Westminster, uh, impacting upon the uh, regulate uh, the UK wide regulators, then that would require a separate legislative consent motion of the Northern Ireland Assembly to that route being used. Okay, thank you. And the final one from me, Peter, is in relation to there is reference to senior management um, and uh, allowing the regulation of senior man management. Has that been put in for a specific purpose and are there plans to regulate senior management in that way? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Chair, for picking up on that. Uh, I, in a sense, uh, this probably reflects the fact that this is a UK wide um, uh, 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 provision here. Uh, and. I suppose then that reflects really maybe potential emerging thinking in particularly DHSC in, in England. Uh, so uh, it's, and as to say, this is simply a permissive part. They, they are sort of scanning ahead and looking at that potentially they might want to do this, but clearly again, they would have to have a separate process of consultation, et cetera. And to the extent though that that would or would not apply to any other country of the United Kingdom, would be something to be uh, worked through. Certainly for Northern Ireland, it would require uh, the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly if it was to apply to here. And there is precedent, uh, if I may say, Chair, for this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the, um, uh, it was decided to uh, bring a new part of the nursing workforce under regulation called nursing associates. Uh, and, but it, those, uh, they do not exist, are not used in either uh, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland. And so the, the actual regulatory provision was only extended to England. So uh, even though it's operating through a, a UK wide regulator, in this case, the NCM, uh, Nursing uh, Midwifery Council, sorry. So just to reassure uh, Chair and, and members that uh, that is simply a looking ahead by DHC, it's a potentially, but it's not something that I'm aware of is on our agenda. But again, we would know that Ireland uh, Assembly would be, and Minister would be fully in control of that process should it be decided to apply it here. Okay, thank you. And just just leading from that, then, and, and, and there is that that level of uh, of commitment that there would be an LCM and and regulation here, but. Um, should should that be progressed, but is there anything within the LCM that would prevent us from initiating that here? If we decided to to go down an approach like that, uh, does this LCM prevent us from initiating and taking our own our own uh, our own regulations in that respect or similar well, issues? Yeah, so, well, I suppose to, to the extent certainly uh, should we um, generally uh, chair we. Uh, for the reasons are outlined in terms of the fact that um, education and of healthcare professionals and the movement of healthcare professionals operates on a UK wide basis, then the general approach is to operate on a UK wide basis. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned there's a separate issue of the PSNI, uh, the Pharmaceutical Society in Northern Ireland is very specific geographically limited to, to our, re our region. 
but uh, generally uh, it, we move forward on the basis of consensus across the four countries because there's a common interest in ensuring that it operates uh, for the benefit of all parts of the NHS. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. So I don't see any other indications there, so I'm going to move on to the final LCM, which is uh, arms length bodies and the transfer of functions. So we're now being joined by Dr Janice Bailey, who is Head of Research and Development in the Public Health Agency, um, uh, and she is joined by Joan Hardy, who is in the Secondary Care Directorate. And uh, Janice and Joan will brief on provisions relating to ALBs and the transfer of functions. So, just checking, Janice, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yep, so go ahead, Janice, then, with the, your opening remarks or briefing, if you like, and then we'll go to members' questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, just a second, because my phone has gone off. Um, so, essentially, both Joan and myself are going to deal with separate parts of, of this particular LCM, and my involvement here is in relation to the proposal that the Secretary of State would be enabled to transfer functions of um, various ALBs um, sim simply with consultation um, with the Northern Ireland um, members. And so, from my point of view, um, our work is with the Health Research Authority, with which um, myself, as a member of the Four Nations Policy Group, has a well-established relationship, which we are um, involved in the ongoing um, approvals of through ethics and research governance for UK-wide um, research studies uh, and clinical trials of um, medications and medical devices. Um, as as a part of this, we have um, mutually owned IT assets which are um, open for um, applications to researchers across the four nations, which covers um, both ethical opinion and governance approvals um, applications. And we also have around that IT infrastructure of processes to ensure UK-wide compatibility. And as a result of that, um, staffing resources in Northern Ireland are in place to deliver in response to these processes um, uh, and ensure that any part, any researcher from any part of the UK can make an application to lead a research project in, in, in any of the four nations at a given time. Um, we've been working with the HRA for about 10 years since they um, were put in place in 2011. And we have developed that relationship on a consultative basis over the years alongside the HRA and the other members of that Four Nations Policy Group, which includes the MHRA as well as some of the other regulatory, regulatory bodies that are UK-wide. So, in terms of the um, process of consultation, um, we are working up the with other uh, colleagues on the MOU to ensure that we are content with the consultative process that will be in place, um, and we're reasonably reassured by the confirmation that um, there would be early engagement, um, continuity of the board membership, and ongoing financial and operational issues via the MOU. Um, so essentially, I think we have uh, that. That really sums up our our um, involvement with this in the, in terms of the LCM. I'll pass over to Joan, maybe. Thank you. And checking with you, Joan. Then, can you hear us okay? I can, Chair. Um, and again, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Because um, yep. my system is a bit yes, strange. Yes, we're hearing you clearly. We're not seeing you, Joan, but we are hearing you clearly there. Oh, sorry, my camera is on, so I don't know what what the issue is. So sorry about that. Okay, not um, right. Yes, as Janet says, um, uh, we're jointly briefing on the LCM for the ALB transfer. My areas of interest are NHS blood and transplant, which is known as NHSBT, and the Human Tissue Authority, and the LCM. Um, 
would provide assurance to the ALB transfer functions provision introduces a new primary power to allow the Secretary of State to transfer functions to and from specified bodies. And these are two areas that, whilst they are transferred items, um, we are part of the Human Tissue Act, which covers England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And um, certainly for organ donation, it is done on a UK-wide basis by NHSBT. So we're part of a UK-wide organisation. And the same for the Human Tissue Authority. They provide advice and oversight regulation for the whole of the UK. So um, in the legislation, um, there is provision, as Janice has said, for consultation and the MOU will go down into greater detail. We are working on that. So we are reassured that the arrangements we have in place will continue and that if there's any change at all, we will be consulted early on it. Um, my main areas of concern before we got that reassurance were that services would be continued and that we would continue to have full representation on the boards plus governance of the organisations and the legislation does provide that assurance, particularly for NHS blood and transplant because we do pay them a considerable amount of money for that. And more importantly, we are too small in Northern Ireland to be able to sustain an organ donation and transplantation service without being part of the UK service. So I am reassured by the legislation. Okay. Is that you, uh, is that, is that you Joan? Yeah. It is, yes. Happy to take any questions on either of those two organisations. Okay. okay, well, a couple then from myself, and then I'll go to members. Um, so, again, a similar one in relation to, to the, the previous one around that regulations will be required. Again, will those regulations be through Westminster or through the Assembly, should regulations be required? Uh, Chair, if this is in relation to um, NHSBT and the Human Tissue Authority, they are UK-wide legislation. I would have to check on that, but the legislation for those are done through Westminster, because it is the Human Tissue Authority. Okay. So, um, but I will check out on that and come back to the committee. And, and would there be any direct impact on the current services, such as organ donation, as a result of any of these? Well, we've been given an assurance that the service would continue and that any current services would just transfer to the new organisation. But that's obviously something that we would want to drill down into greater detail in the MOU. But the legislation does provide an assurance that you know Northern Ireland will be fully considered, as will the other devolved administrations. But it is something that we will drill down deeper in the MOU to make sure that those assurances are there and that steps are put in place if there is any variation proposed. And it, will that MOU be available in advance of the LCM being, being, being brought forward? Well, like Patricia had referred to earlier, it is still early, early stages, but they are working at pace, so I don't actually have a timeline for that at the moment. Um, so I imagine that it will be similar timelines as Patricia had talked about, but I can check that out and come back to you. Well, that is that is a bit of a concern, I have to say, in relation to, um, you know, fundamentally, before the detail is available, you're, you're almost uh, having to make that decision. Um, what, what level of consultation has there been with here, specifically here in the north, in relation to this and the impact it may have? Well, we have been in touch with our officials in DHSC. Um, there's been ongoing uh, discussions over the summer period. Um, that's when, when sort of this sort of came to our attention. So uh, there's just been sort of maybe from about, I would say maybe sort of May, June time, the discussions have been ongoing about this clause. So other than the, the DHS officials who are bringing it forward, have you had any negotiations, any consultation with the arms length bodies here or how they feel this might impact them going forward? We haven't, Chair, because we haven't actually any indication that any of this would happen. Um, you know, there's no details provided. At the moment, it is just to give the powers that if they felt that it was necessary. So there's no details around what, um, what if any, powers would transfer across and who to. Yeah, well, if no changes are being planned, what's the need for us to, if you like, sacrifice some of our scrutiny in terms of uh, giving Instead of a legislative approach, we would then be giving ourselves a consultative uh, <laughs> angle. So if there's no changes being planned, what's the urgency or need for the LCM? 
Well, the LCM would put in pl place that if England do want to go ahead, that they would consult with us, because without that, you know, it's um, it's all under the Human Tissue Act, which is, say, a three-country act, so we would have to be consulted because of that. But we would be. No, but, 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 but we would be. If if we if this if this went through, would we not be losing out on our legislative, our core legislative oh. ability, and be, have that replaced with a consultative one? Um, I'm not sure about that, Chair. I'd have to check because at the moment the legislation does lie in Westminster, even though it is a reserved matter. You know, for NHSBT and the HTA, you know, they are established under Westminster Acts rather than Northern Ireland. And what benefit is expected to flow here, other than uh, per perhaps efficiency or, or an easier system? Um, but what, what benefits are expected to flow to any of these bodies as a result of these changes? Well, they're the only benefits that have been highlighted in the legislation. You know, it hasn't gone down into any great detail at the minute because we are not aware of what, if any, proposals are to move them across. But that is what they are citing the legislation is for if they feel the need to move them because of those issues. Okay, well, I have to say I, I, would, I would have some concern around the lack of clarity and the lack of purpose. And, and it, it does seem, you know, I don't know, it, it almost... It almost looks like a bit of a preemptive power grab and, and then we would deal with the consequences and we will be consulted but however we would have we would have uh, and, and some of the consultation in general around these lcms have been very very scant particularly in relation to how they impact here in the north anyway i'll go to members questions there i have pam cameron indicating and then jerry so go ahead pam thanks chair and thank you Pam, um for your attendance this morning um, could I ask, uh, do the powers granted under the LCM to the Secretary of State in respect of the arm's length bodies have the potential to disrupt current four country arrangements in terms of shared research or regulation that, underpin that underpins health services in Northern Ireland? Um, if you want me to um, initially speak about research, um, just in, in, the, in the same vein as the previous conversation, HRA is actually an England only body. So um, any conversations and discussions around research and, and the management and governance of research is a um, devolved matter. So we do, we do have our own um, decision making powers around that in, in terms of the operational discussions around that. So I can't really envisage at the moment um, that having an impact on, on research, particularly in Northern Ireland, and hopefully it would be a beneficial one if there were any. Thank you for that, um, Janice. Uh, and I suppose I'm going to ask this question, but I think it's really kind of been asked already by the chair, and that's in, in the round, has the government any indication of what it intends to do? with the powers to regulate the functions of arms-length bodies? So specifically, I have not heard anything around, you know, a plan to to make any adjustments to the, the current arrangements of Health Research Authority. Um, and certainly I can't speak for any of the other um, ALBs that are listed, but I have not heard anything about a specific plan. Thank you. And, and by way of by way of follow up to that one, um, what what bodies have you identified here that would be impacted in the future by, by this? If if everything's been done in Westminster, what bodies here are being uh, included within the scope? Okay, chair, I can address that. There are three. The, the only there's no actual bodies in Northern Ireland. But the likes of NHS BET, the three that interested Northern Ireland were NHS Blood and Transplant, the Human Tissue Authority, who both provide services, and as Janice has said, the health sorry, I just can't the the Health Research Authority. So there's no actual bodies here, but obviously the services provided here. We have the transplant. A kidney transplant service at Belfast City Hospital, um, and then obviously donation of um, organs, which can take place around the country. And 
then also the Human Tissue Authority would license bodies as well. So that could affect different that could affect different areas around Northern Ireland. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm conscious. I'm conscious. We are looking. We are looking at a, at a you know, soft tissue, an organ donation bill, and also conscious that we have heard in evidence the importance of um, and the and the advantage that we have in, in some ways here in terms of uh, cross border cooperation and some of that. And I think it will be important that that nothing happens to impede or impinge upon that that cooperation. Um, and sometimes I've got a sense. I have to say that Westminster doesn't always have a full understanding or consideration of those particular circumstances that we have, or indeed particular challenges or particular opportunities. But anyway, that, that will be for, I think, for further, for further scrutiny in relation to that. Any other questions, members, in relation to the gen Oh, sorry, Jerry. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, Chair. A um, couple of questions. I'm uh, sure you're concerned, Chair, about the, it seems like a power grab in many ways, and, and there's a lot of questions that remain unanswered about that. Um, in, re in regards to obviously the organ donation bill, as you refer to, Chair, you know we're obviously processing our own legislation through here. But as I understand it, this bill if passed would allow the minister to kind of override uh, some of those decisions. Maybe not necessarily directed to the bill, but the wider issue of, of organ donation. So, um, I mean, what assurances have we uh, have been sought, or can we get around that the bill um, and everything connected to it will remain? And that issue generally will remain in the power and hands of, of the assembly. Is my first question, and then my second question is: uh, it was referred to there about human uh, tissue. Uh, uh, is there any uh, consideration or thought, um, uh, or, or work being uh, discovered or, or pressed rather? And um, there's a lot of uh, concern about the um, discovery, um, recovery of tissue of, of people who lost. Loved ones uh, during the troubles. Um, is there any connected work to that? That you know there may be increased powers in the Secretary of State to um, you know uh, protect that work or to stop information being released uh, about that kind of activity. Um, I don't know if it's connected, but it's something that's really uh, flagging up with me. So um, appreciate if you don't have an answer on that, but I, I would appreciate some further um, exploratory work um, around that issue as well. With regards to your second question about the tissue um, from loved ones from the Troubles, and I'm sorry, I don't have any information on that, but certainly I will look into that and come back to you. I'm sorry, my, um, I lost connection a wee bit there. Could I just double check your first question, please? Yeah, so basically, similar to the Chair, I mean, we're obviously process, progressing the organ donation bill, um, <laughs> but as I understand it, you know, this uh, bill of past will allow the Secretary of State, the Health Minister, to override certain decisions in connection to uh, organ donation and blood and transplant. So, really, what I'm trying to ascertain is um, do all aspects of organ donation still uh, remain in the in the power of the Assembly and the Minister and the Executive, or are there aspects where uh, the Secretary of State, the Health Secretary, can override um, certain decisions around organ donation? All right. Um, I'm not sure of the legal aspects of that, but organ donation is a reserve or a, a devolved matter. And what is proposed is about the operational aspects of NHS blood and transplant. Um, and that is about the delivery of organ donation. Um, so that's about the operational side of collecting the organs, allocating the organs. So it's about that rather than making us policy decision on what way we collect those organs, you know, so that, that's a completely separate thing. Um, so I can't see it impacting on the opt-out legislation, so because it's about the operational side of it. Um, with regards to the human, human Tissue Authority is actually working quite closely with my colleagues who are working on the opt-out legislation to, to develop codes of practice, because obviously that will will need those for when the change comes, if the change comes into law. But with regards to actual decisions on how we donate, that is not what um this clause or the lcm is about okay thanks okay thank you chair can i just add uh, some slightly uh, to sort of a bit of background on um uh, organs tissues and blood around the um common frameworks that are being established on the the quality as well um, it, it's just in terms of to give some reassurance to the the committee that there's work ongoing within the four nations 
um, that the common frameworks will allow where there is to be divergence, there's process for um, working together, consultation and dispute resolution. Um, we were expecting those common frameworks. We have shared summaries with the committee and we were expecting them to be with the committee um, last month. Unfortunately, there's been some further discussions around the internal market and divergence um, and we're hoping that they will be with the committee before the end of December, which will give them some, hopefully, assurances around um, a sort of divergence between the four nations and how that will be managed in terms of blood tissue and organs, and in particular, quality. Yeah, did you finish on quality there, Patricia? I'm not sure if you finished yes. on quality. Yes, yes yeah. I did. Yes. It, cut, it cut off rather quickly, so so just wanted to check that. Um, yeah, okay, and I think, I think actually that, that does, you, you raise a, a significant point there, Patricia, because the uh, Moving into the future with, with all that uncertainty and divergence as you refer to, and indeed the recent and within recent days the uh, the the focus on the European Court and how disputes would be resolved in these very sensitive and complex issues, that is that is a concern that, that we're almost go, moving into uncharted waters, but at the same time we're we're putting in place um, powers or that, that, that will impact our ability to navigate those uncharted and potentially troubled waters. So I think I think that is that is something that is of concern. And again, linking back to the, the very significant additional challenges or particular challenges and opportunities we have here in the north, um, and, and on a small island. So um, thank you for your presentations there, um, and thank you for your for your answers, and also for your commitment to provide the committee with some additional pieces of information that that were sought there. Um, I'd like to wish you all the very best. But thank you for for appearing at our committee this morning. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Um, yeah, I, I, I can. I, well, I will firstly advise members that once an LCM is led in the assembly and it hasn't been led yet, the committee then has 15 working days to report back to the assembly on its consideration of the LCM. Um, so I just want to check: Do members have any further issues or clarity that they wish to, or issues they wish to seek clarification on? I think we need more information, Chair. You know, as, as was highlighted in the questions, you know, there's clearly clearly a gap with what's being brought forward and some concerns. So I think we need to just make sure that um, officials present that to the committee before we can make a, an informed choice. I think. Yeah, members agree that we will take an additional additional information from the department in relation to these, given the concerns. Yeah, members agreed. Okay. Uh, okay, members, thank you. So, moving on then to item seven, which is in relation to the adoption and children bill and the consideration, particularly of the bill timeline and extension. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1 of the pack and to the draft motion to extend committee stage, which is at tab 7.2. The call for evidence for this bill closed on the 8th of October, and we now need to decide, members, on who we wish to invite. For, to give oral evidence to assist with our consideration of the bill. We should also decide on whether or not we wish to request an extension uh, to the 30-day committee stage period. So I'll just ask the clerk now to give us a brief overview on the responses received. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Just to give a, members a very brief overview, um, committee received a total of um, 16 responses so far on this bill. So you'll see a list of those at page um, 97 of your pack. Um, so it ranges from Action for Children through to VoIPIC, a, a number of other adoption um, organisations and uh, fostering organisations. So um, essentially, um, I, I would sort of say, look, we'll, we'll try and schedule all of those um, uh, different organisations. Um, we'll try and put them into batches um, for briefings, and we'll try and maybe do the briefings over. Um, uh, maybe three Thursdays, um, but we're also waiting on responses from the Law Society and Children's Law Centre as well, who have said they should have responses with us by the end of this week. So it's just to check members are content for, for the staff to go and try and start scheduling some of these organisations and looking at how we um, uh, put them together and, and, and get through them. Um, the other thing is just to say, obviously with the size of this bill and the extension period, um, I'm certainly recommending that we push that as far as we can. 
which would be the 28th of, of January. Um, so again, that's just highlighting um, certainly from from staff point of view our recommendations on it. Okay, thank you, Clerk. Um, so, members, then um, any any thoughts on that on what the clerk has advised there, or any uh, in in terms of the oral evidence sessions? Uh, I I think it certainly will be useful looking at those groups. I think they're they're all they all have, have valuable input. So, I certainly will be in favour of that approach. Any other thoughts, members, or are you content? Members content. Sorry, Chair, ahead, just please. to say, we will be trying to organise a couple of informal sessions as well, in addition to these. So we, we have a couple of sessions we're looking at with the likes of OIPIC, um, who will be able to bring um, young people um, along to an informal session, and then possibly with some adoptive parents as well. Um, so we're looking at some informal sessions um, during the month of November as well, in addition to these. Yeah, and we'll, we'll possibly try and take those out into, into areas as well. So. That's another angle on that. Okay, so members are content with that approach in terms of the uh, in terms of the oral evidence and uh, taking taking further evidence uh, on the oral evidence. And then, in view of the heavy workload as outlined by the clerk, there, committee members, it's proposed we seek an extension to the twenty eighth of January, twenty twenty two. But as always, aim to report before that date if possible. But it is an extensive and a complex bill. So, would members be content with an extension to the twenty eighth of January? 22. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, members. Um, moving on then, members, to item 8, which is in relation to abortion services, safe access zones bill. So I remind members that the bill was introduced on the 13th of September, and we received a briefing on the principles of the bill from the bill sponsor, Claire Bailey, at last week's meeting, and that it passed second stage on the 12th of October. I refer members to the clerk's memo in your table pack at tab 8.1. Are members content that we proceed to a call for evidence on this bill for a period of three weeks in view of the limited time available? Agreed, sir. Agreed? Yeah, members agreed. Thank you. Um, clerk, can you give us some advice there in terms of dates for consultation? Yep, thanks, Chair. Just to say we will get the um, notice put out early next week. And we'll put the closing date then of Friday the 12th of November, um, which will allow um, taking into account recess as well over that period. So that the, the closing date for the consultation would be the 12th, and I'll notify members once the, the call for evidence goes live. Okay, thank you. Chair? Yes, uh, who is that? Uh, Paula? Paula? Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Um, Chair, I'm just wondering, um, since in previous sessions we've taken some evidence or heard from the likes of the Chief Executives of the Trust in terms of um, what the impact has been on the protests outside their um, reproductive health services, for example, are we able to lift that um, information um, and, and add it to the um, evidence for our consideration of this bill? Yeah, the clerk's indicating I think that that would be. Yeah, we, we have indicated that in the Assembly that can, we had can taken certainly evidence. certainly agree to, um, to pull over that evidence that we've received and put it into this report. Um, again, okay. um, the Chair will mention this in a wee minute about the evidence that we've received as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, so on, on, a, on a related point, uh, Paula, I, I was going to ask the committee, do the committee wish to target a request for written submissions to those organisations that did provide submissions on the SFIAA bill that are relevant to this? Um, would members be content that we, we seek a written submissions from those organisations? Good idea. Yes, Chair. And in yes, addition, sure. I, I think as, uh, um, consulting as widely as possible with this um, is, is a good start, and I suppose a lot that contributed to the SFI uh, certainly would have something to say about it as well. Yep. And in addition, would members be content that we seek the views of the Department of Health, the Department of Justice, and the Committee for Justice in relation to these, given the cross-cutting elements of that? Agree. Yep. Yep. Members Chair. agree. Chair. Yes. Go ahead, Paula. Sorry, just maybe it'd be worthwhile then including in that list the chief executives of the five trusts, since they skirted around it or, or you know just added a bit in terms of their overall presentation in the past they may wish to put in a written submission as well so i would ask that we ask them for written um, evidence as well thank you yep members agreed with that yeah, yeah sure i i don't don't know if we're, we're going through it right now in terms of 
in the individual calls for evidence uh, as in organizations maybe that comes at, a, at the next stage in relation to who, who you'd want but certainly the psni would need to be included in that both written and potentially oral briefing yeah i'll just ask the clerk to uh, uh, just just to say if members of any other organizations or groups that they wish us the the right to specifically i'd be happy to um, to take them by by email afterwards, and we can make sure that they're aware of the call for evidence. Okay, thank you. And members, could we also seek approval to commission a research paper on the Safe Access Zones Bill, including particularly reference to national and international examples of safe zones and where where they have where they have operated, just to give us a, a more of an overarching view of that? Would members be content? Yep. Yeah. And I see an indication from Alan then. I'll, I'll come in, Alan, I'm not sure maybe it was an earlier point you wanted to make. Chairman, yeah, yeah, no, the, um, uh, Jonathan there has, has, has raised the point. I didn't know whether it would be appropriate or not to, you, you know, from a protocol point of view, to invite the police. Uh, but I was going to suggest that, and I would support Jonathan in that. I think that during the debate, uh, there, were, there were a lot of legitimate comments about uh, possibly present legislation did give the police certain powers and stuff. Uh, and I think it would be proper to get the full picture from the, the police of just what their what their difficulties are and how they see it. So yeah, I would support that. But that, as I said, that's maybe something further down the line. Yeah, I'll just double check with the clerk. That is, is there? Yeah, we, we can certainly invite um, written evidence, and then once the written evidence comes in, the committee can request that the PSNI come to give oral evidence as well. Okay. Okay, so thank you, members. And then just finally on this issue, to check our members' content to forward this PMB and the autism bill to the examiner for statutory rules for her advice on whether the bill contains any delegated powers, and if so, her views on those delegated powers. Are members content with that? Yeah. Yep. Chair. Yes, Pam, go ahead. Just on the mention of it, I just want to claim and address this proposal of the autism bill. Yep, thank you, Pam. Noted. Okay. All right, members, moving on then to the next uh, agenda items, which are coronavirus statutory rules. Officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of the regulations. There was an additional rule inserted into the table papers, but I, I propose that we defer that just to give members a bit more time to have a look at that at that one. But we will then go ahead, and if, if uh, that rule is a tab 18.1 of the table papers, the other, uh, I refer members to the clerk's memo in the table, well, that's relating to that one as well, so I'll, I'll, uh, well, I'll refer members, it's in the table pack at tab 9.3. So we'll go ahead now and welcome Ms Elaine Colgan, who's Head of Health Protection Branch in the Department of Health. Uh, can you hear us okay, Elaine? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Richard Duffin, Health Protection Branch, Department of Health. Are you there, Richard? Yes, Chair. Thank you. And Mr. Peter Lunny, Deputy Director of COVID Strategy and Recovery in the Executive Office. Is that Lunny or uh, is that the correct pronunciation, Peter? Uh, Lunny, Chair. Lunny, thank you. Okay, so listen, you're all very welcome to our committee this afternoon, and I'll, I'll go back to Elaine, and uh, Elaine, can you outline how you're going to manage the briefing, and we'll go to members' questions then as quickly as we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the invitation today. Um, I'm firstly going to hand over to Richard, who's going to outline a little bit of information relating to the process of making the regulations. As we've noted, concerns of members regarding the fact that regulations are still being scrutinised scrutinized after they're being made. So we'd just like to take a short moment to explain uh, why this is still required and the process around that. Um, I will then brief members on the regulations themselves, and I'm noting, Chair, that you would prefer to defer Amendment 17, so um, I will just focus then on Amendment 16 and Amendment number 6 to the face covering regulations. Um, Peter is here with us today from the Executive Office, and he can address questions along with ourselves afterwards relating to the policy intent behind the regulations, which is within the responsibility of the Executive Office. Um, so I'll hand over now to Richard, who will begin the briefing. Thank you. Okay. Hello? Yes, Peter. Hi. Yep, go ahead. We're hearing you there and seeing you. Okay. Or oh, Richard, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just going to brief the committee on, on the, the use of the, the emergency procedure. Section 25Q of the Public Health Act, Northern Ireland, 1967, sets out the assembly procedure to be used in defined circumstances when using some of these powers. This is called the emergency procedure. The emergency procedure allows certain regulations which otherwise have been subject to the draft formative procedure 
be made without a draft of the regulations first having been laid before the Assembly and approved by the Assembly. It may be used if the regulations contain a declaration that the Department is of the opinion, by reason of urgency, that it is necessary to make the regulations without a draft first having been laid and approved. One acceptable reason of urgency includes the case where a regulation must be made in short notice by a specific time and by a specific date in order to implement the executive's decision. If the emergency procedure was not used, the, the dis executive's decision would not be implemented until about approximately one month after they were taken, assuming all the processes were progressed at pace. This would be difficult to defend. Pilots may not place for the time, even though it had already been taken by the executive, that they were no longer needed. Richard, just, Richard, if the restrictions just, uh, uh, were to be imposed. Richard, Richard sorry, sorry, to, sorry to cut across you there, Richard. Richard, you, we, we're starting to lose your sound a bit, Richard, and I think it's, I think we're losing it the other way as well. Um, so we're having difficulty with your sound, Richard. I wonder, could you, could you, uh, could you pick that up again? I'm not sure if you have access to a headset, but we were losing parts of your sound. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? That seems better. Yes. Right. I've, I've just moved a bit closer. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on from where I left off. Um, if the restrictions were to be imposed, they could not be put in place quickly enough for the effect on the transmission of the COVID-19 that's needed. Members should also note that it is, remains a confirmatory procedure. Regulations made by the emergency procedure must be laid before the Assembly. The regulations made by the emergency procedure will cease to have effect at the end of the period of 28 days, beginning with the day on which they are made, unless during that 28-day period the regulations are approved by a resolution of the Assembly. If the Assembly during the 28-day period decides to reject the regulations, the regulations cease to have effect at the end of that day instead. I hope that members will understand that these are urgent procedures and are not emergency powers, and that they contain sunset clauses. I will now hand back over to Elaine to brief you on the regulations before us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the regulations before us today. Um, committee is considering two statutory rules then that were introduced following decisions of the executive on the 27th of September. Uh, so SR276, which was amendment number 16 to the restrictions regulations was made on the 30th of September 21. And the executive agreed at its meeting on the 27th of September to remove the legal requirement to socially distance in both retail and indoor visitor attractions and that the wearing of face coverings would still remain a legal requirement in those settings. They also decided to, or the requirement to socially distance in indoor seated venues, such as theatres, concert halls and cinemas, uh, was removed, but only during a performance rehearsal or recording. Um, and it, was, it's, it is strongly advised that other mitigating measures are utilised by the sector in lieu of that. Um, secondly, then, uh, turning to the face covering amendment number 6, SR274. Uh, so during the drafting of Amendment Number 16 and the restriction regulations, it came to our attention that the wording within the face covering regulations didn't accurately reflect the executive policy in theatres, concert halls and cinemas, for example, so those larger indoor venues. Uh, so the face covering regulations allowed face coverings to be removed when seated at a place which sold or provided food. Um, now, at the time of drafting, this was accurate because hospitality was the only sector that was open at that point. Um, however, when larger indoor venues opened later, that, later in the summer, um, that wording uh, was no longer appropriate for those settings. Uh, so amendment number six updated, updated the wording to reflect that and ensure that the regulations were accurate to the executive's uh, decisions on those sectors. Um, so effectively what the amendment means is that a person may remove their face covering when seated at a table in hospitality, which was always the, the position. It hasn't changed that position. It's just um, changed the wording. However, in the larger venues, such as concert halls, theatres, cinemas and conference facilities, face coverings must be worn at all times when seated and can only be removed when the person is actively eating. They are not meant to, and are not able to be removed for the entire duration of any performances. 
Um, so that's the summary of the two amendments considered today and I trust that's been helpful and I'm happy to address along with Richard and Peter any questions that members may have. Thank you Elian and um, I have a couple of indications there. So a couple quickly then from myself just as in relation to 274 and the face coverings. I had asked a, a written question around the compliance measures and it states that there are no, the, the response stated that there are no formal measures in place to monitor compliance to COVID-19 restrictions, including those regarding face coverings, separately to enforcement monitoring. So is that something that uh, needs to be looked at in terms of monitoring compliance and, and ascertaining um, what impact compliance is having on transmission of the disease, or indeed what impact measures are having on compliance? Yes. Um, so you're, you're correct, there isn't a, a formal mechanism to monitor compliance. There is a mechanism by which any enforcement action taken by PSNI is tracked, uh, and PSNI publish those statistics on their website, uh, and we do keep an eye on that. Um, what I would say in terms of face coverings is we are reviewing the face covering regulations just as a holistic piece of exercise um, within the next week or two, but, uh, pending the changes on the 31st of October uh, that the executive have agreed. Um, and whilst at this point there's no there's no necessary plans to introduce any additional enforcement action or anything um, compliance is something very much in our minds um i'm um, maybe going to ask peter would you be able to update a little bit on the publicity plans on the on the face coverings uh yes chair um we did uh, a lot of sectoral engagement, I think, week before last, uh, and we covered a, a range of sectors from uh, hospitality and events through to retail and business. Um, and one of the issues that we explored with them in, in quite some detail was around messaging, uh, both messaging coming out from the centre, uh, but also messaging that they themselves do in their own business areas. Uh, and it was to focus in on, on things like face coverings uh, and, and compliance levels with face coverings. Um, we, we had been told anecdotally that um, maybe some 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 uh, sectors where there would have been clear signage before reminding customers or users that face coverings were required, that that signage had come down. Um, so we were trying to get undertakings from them that that they, they would review that again and, and put put signage up. Um, we will, as part of our autumn winter comms, again be looking at the, the baseline behaviours, the safer behaviours that, that we would expect the, the public to follow uh, as we move into what will undoubtedly be a, a more challenging time. Uh, and one of those will be around face coverings. So with the, the, the messaging around face coverings will be refreshed. Um, Elaine has correctly said we, 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 don't, uh, we don't routinely uh, track compliance uh, across uh, all, all sectors, but uh, there are some key sectors where fa uh, face covering compliance is measured, uh, and public transport would be one of those. Uh, DFI would track uh, com uh, compliance on public transport, uh, which, which still remains um, reasonably high. I think there probably is some evidence of, of a, a reduction in numbers as more relaxations have come in, uh, but hopefully we will again address that through, through messaging. Um, one of the reasons that we're keen to keep face coverings in legislation rather than moving it across to guidance is because of the, 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 the likely impact uh, that that would have on compliance. We, we know from an exper the experience of Transport for London, for example, uh, that whenever face coverings moved across to guidance, compliance rates fell by about 30%. Um, we also did some polling in Northern Ireland uh, under the auspices of the Task Force, Task Force Adherence Group, uh, and it showed remarkably similar uh, responses from consultees who said that if, if, if face coverings were in guidance rather than in law, uh, about 30% of them would be less likely to follow that. So, so it is an issue where we need to make sure that the messaging uh, remains clear and sharp, uh, and we need uh, a sort of a collaborative effort to try and keep uh, uh, compliance rates up. Okay, and, and Elaine, am I right there? Were you, were you uh, indicating that there will now be some compliance measures undertaken in order to track this? Um, probably not any additional tracking. Um, the, the engagement with sectors is the key method. This, you know, the, men, the, the engagement that Peter mentioned last week, uh, our side are involved in as well. And um, the sectors very much know how many of their customers are complying and whilst it's not hard statistics um, it is able to give us a sense of compliance generally uh, to feed into the regulation decisions and surely it would be a good idea and wouldn't be beyond the wit of of of, of the department or anyone to put in some you know sample measuring you know maybe taking 
a, 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 you know, a bus or a train or a shopping centre, surely there could be some way of, of putting in some measurements. Because if we don't measure it, you know, we're, we're, based, we're, we're talking about anecdotal eh, or, or eh, information from elsewhere. So I think it would be useful if we had some kind of monitoring and, and eh, measuring going on in that respect. Yeah, if, if I can come in, Chair, uh, certainly, I mean, I think your, your point is well made, and, and we do have um, specific uh, instances of where we have done tracking. I know that the uh, University of Ulster did a piece of research uh, around compliance rates with, with various measures, uh, and also the, the polling that I referred to, which is, is still ongoing through Ipsos Mori, uh, gives us feedback around uh, compliance rates. Um, but I, I, I'll take that back to the adherence group, uh, and again, I'll, I'll feed back your comments and see whether there's more that we can do in that space. Okay, thank you, Peter. And my final one then is on on the 276 in relation to the advice. Um, so the, we've seen the removal of uh, of the advice from visitors to stay at a safe distance, and I'm wondering what evidence underpinned that advice, and is it is it the case that social distancing is no longer seen as advisable? Or what? What? Why? Why was that measure taken, and uh, what does it say in terms of messaging around social distancing more generally? Um, well, uh, Peter, if I deal with this, the advice part, and then I'll hand over to you on the rationale for the decision. Um, the advice really is focused on uh, the, the advice from the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer that was provided. Um, in the context of the relaxing regulations. Uh, obviously, we're in a period where um, hospitalizations um, are, are stable and they're coming down slightly. Um, and so we are in a context of wanting to relax things to, to get out of the restriction. And, the, and that Peter can talk more about that. Um, but certainly the advice was that if you are removing social distancing of one meter, which was what was in place before, then it is important to consider other mitigations to limit the, the effect that that would have on the transmission of the virus. Um, so Peter, do you want to, to cover any policy side? Yes, thanks, Elaine. Um, Chair, the, the approach that has been taken uh, in relation to the relaxations is uh, the Executive Office Chair across the departmental working group um, and each of the departments uh, and some other key agencies are, are represented on that and, and attend that on a, used to be a weekly basis, now a fortnightly basis. They engage with their sectors and, and have a good understanding of, of what pressures their, their sector is facing, uh, and, and they would have put forward proposals for relaxations. Um, those, those proposals are then collated and are sent through to CMO CSA for advice on what the health implications would be if those relaxations were to be agreed, uh, and, and health would come back with some clear guidance around whether it was low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and, and what mitigations could be applied to, to, to address that risk more. The, more. More recently, because the number of relaxations have been reduced, uh, they, rather than waiting for departmental proposals, uh, all, all the restrictions are tabled at executive uh, and advice is given on all of them. Sectoral engagement has shown for some time that social distancing is a real challenge to businesses and in, in some sectors uh, one meter social distancing can reduce capacity by up to 70 uh, percent and really makes a lot of sectors economically unviable the executive whenever it meets to consider restrictions is trying to balance the real health concerns that the virus presents along with uh, societal and community and economic considerations and that's probably why social distancing has remained in place for so long. Um, but we've, we, we got to the point now where, as Elaine has outlined, figures are stabilizing, hospital pressures are, uh, have, have been reasonably stable, um, and it was felt appropriate, the executive felt that it was appropriate to re remove social distancing across into guidance, um, which gives more flexibility to businesses. But they did at the same time emphasize the importance of other mitigations. Okay, thank you. And um, in relation to the advice, I think it was yourself mentioned uh, that research from UU. Could we get that information forwarded on uh, in relation to the compliance and, and monitoring issue, um, please, Peter? Yes, absolutely, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so going then to members, and I have Pam, Paula, and Jerry. Go ahead, Pam, please. 
Thanks, Chair, and thank you, panel. Um, obviously, compliance has been mentioned there, but I wanted to ask if uh, the transmission in indoor format venues is being specifically monitored. Um, and then I want to also ask if um, will the removal of face covering requirement whilst consuming food or drink extend to nightclubs when they open? And if you could talk more generally around why face coverings and nightclubs will work. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, I'll, I'll take the, both of those questions. Um, so transmission and indoor venues and how it's monitored. Um, the, P, the, the contact tracing, whenever um, people have been identified as having tested positive, they will go back over the history of the, the person's activity for, for 48 hours only. Um, that is really because that's when their person was infectious. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily identify where the virus will have been picked up. Um, now that said, whenever there's start, you, the, you know, PHA start to get a picture if there's a commonality coming forward, and they will identify that. And there is clusters and outbreaks reports that are published on the PHA website, um, which which provides some of that information. Um, but we we wouldn't have any granular information of what the level of transmission from a, a case might have been, unless it's identified as one of those clusters. Um, so that's that's probably the first point. In terms of face coverings in nightclubs, the face coverings regulations, it's not just nightclubs with the, the removal from the 31st of the knee of the ability, sorry, of the requirement to be seated whenever you are consuming food and drink generally. So nightclubs and also bars and things, the face covering regulations will need to be reviewed um, because at the moment you would need to have them on whilst you're standing with your, your beverage. So you wouldn't want to have to do that. Uh, so we are looking at how that would, how we can bring the face coverings regulations um, proposals into practical scenario in that case. And we will have to go back to executive to consider things like that. So we are looking at that over the next week or so. Okay, go back to you there, Pam. I think I might have lost Pam. Yeah, okay, Pam, go ahead. No, that's me. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Paula, uh, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for um, the update this morning. My question um, would go back, I think, to Peter there, and he was talking about the attitudinal survey in terms of um, wearing of masks, and I'm just wondering, are there some qualitative questions in there around, you know, why people feel they should be wearing them and why they're still important, even if they're not necessarily um, obligatory in certain uh, or mandatory in certain circumstances? And you mentioned that you were going to update the communications around this. I am concerned that we are still seeing very high levels of um, positive cases coming through. I think in the last week we've had 9,045 percent of those have been in the um, not to 19 age group, just check my figures there. Um, so is any of that messaging going to be directed at that younger age group? Um, obviously, it's maybe because they're more um, uh, circulating in the community. They're the ones who are going to school and still going to sports clubs and stuff. I'm just wondering how the messaging is going to be tailored specifically for that age group. Thank you. Um, th thank you. Um, yes, uh, the 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 communications uh, plan for uh, autumn winter uh, is is being finalized and, and will be um, delivered generally uh, to, to citizens um, but I know EIS have looked at uh, using particular channels that, that maybe focus on those harder to reach groups whether that's the the younger younger people or or, or other hard to reach groups uh, and recently have used sort of social media channels and, and maybe channel channels which uh, paid for channels which they they wouldn't typically have or routinely use. Um, I'm happy to get uh, an update on the autumn winter comms uh, and again provide uh, an update to the, the committee on, on how uh, we, we would plan to reach those harder to reach groups. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Just, just a comment you don't necessarily need to re um, respond to, but I, I am concerned that, that they are probably not, uh, as we know with young people, they're, they're not really looking beyond the real friendship and family groups, but the impact of the increased caseload then in terms of our health service and then the nurses, the briefing we got this morning, the pressure in our health service. And I'm just wondering, is there any way that you could be sophisticated enough to make the messaging of relevance to them, but also then to read across into how this would affect their granny trying to get other services, for example. So I don't need a response, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just conscious of, of the read across. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula and Jerry. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have some serious concerns about T76. 
Um, I mean, obviously, as I understand the regulations currently, social distancing still remains in workplaces and other venues, uh, but it's going to be uh, lifted in uh, um, venues where likely to be alcohol and, and other um, sort of activities going on in terms of people mixing. Um, so I'm really, really concerned about that. Um, you know, not only the message that it sends out, but the increase in cases. So I'd like to ask um, what work uh, has been done around modelling. There's obviously um, a real concern about the winter increase in cases and pressure on, on our NHS. So what work, what work has been done to uh, indicate any increases uh, directly connected to this change uh, being made? Okay, um, so the two points there, the, the, the social distance and in workplaces. So the workplace uh, isn't in regulations. So there's no requirement in, in the regulations to socially distance in workplaces. What is in, in, work, in place in workplaces is a requirement for a risk assessment and for employers to risk assess the, the situation in which they're working and their employees are working and find the best way to safely accommodate staff if they are in the office. Um, so it doesn't legally prescribe social distancing um, or any specific distance that must be between staff. Mm. Um, the the modelling, yes, the modelling is updated every week uh, for the future and it's fed into the autumn winter plans um, that uh, we are looking to and it's published on our website as part of the R paper every week. There's some. Um, uh, figures that you can get in there. Um, so yes, it, the modelling um, is reviewed. The, the modelling itself can't get into the granular detail of looking at the impact of, of any particular scenario. So for example, nightclubs, it doesn't say that the the impact of opening nightclubs will on the model will be this or on R will be this, um, because it's just not possible to get down to that granular detail. Instead, there's a certain number of assumptions made around what the relaxations are likely to do as a collective on R, um, and that's built into the modelling uh, in that way. So um, I hope that addresses the question. Um, slightly, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> I think it, there's a bit of a gap there. I mean, I think it is going to uh, likely uh, uh, lead to uh, an increase in cases. It's a question of how much and how drastically. Um, the other question really is, uh, as I understand, I think it was Peter who, who raised the point, uh, this proposal uh, came from uh, venues or their respective representative organisations. Um, this didn't come from CMO or um, CSA, although they give a, an input uh, and the green uh the call, as I understand it. Um, can we get a, um, a written uh, confirmation of uh, the decision made and the CMO and or CSA's uh, input into that? Uh, and also just uh, finally, I mean, I'm concerned. I mean, uh, the point about it, you know, organisations being economically uh, unviable and under economic pressures, whilst obviously real, and you know, a lot of sympathy uh, with them, uh, and many have sort of gone to the wall or, or likely will do. I'm concerned that that is the overriding uh, decision, seemingly driving this uh, SR rather than public health, rather than likely increasing cases. So I have some really, really serious concerns about this, uh, and I'd like to uh, just ask for, for more uh, information um, about that and, and sort of assurances um, that this will not uh, lead to a huge spike in cases. Uh, and even if it can't be given today, then I think there's, there's serious, serious questions that remain over this SR. Thanks. Okay, um, so a few points I, I think I'll, uh, I've got, have a couple noted here, so I'll just run through them, and then if I haven't, if there's anything I haven't covered, do do say. Um, the proposal itself to relax social distancing, it didn't come from the industry as such. So as Peter suggested, we we've very few restrictions left, um, in, in all truth. So when we we don't actually. Propose, at, the, at the start, we only proposed relaxing certain things, um, and that's what went forward to executive uh, as part of that collaborative work that Peter referred to. Um, but because we've so little left, everything goes to executive all of the time. So there's no longer a proposal from any particular sector. Um, every time the, exec the, the restrictions are considered, the whole thing is on the table. Everything is on the table. Um, so the social distance in measure wasn't driven at this. It wasn't driven by the industry. Um, However, whenever, as Peter mentioned, when the executives making decisions, they are balancing health with other th other factors, economy and society, and um, being two of those. Um, but I suppose to address the case numbers and the 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 the, the, suggest, the, the sort of perception that economy is maybe driving this more than health. Um, the the success of the the vaccination program has been a, a really good success for um, reducing the seriousness of disease in COVID. So 
um, that, that is now what is the driver for decision making. The case numbers will increase as we mix um, and, and that's natural. However, if you look at the hospitalizations, um, the, even the peak of hospitalizations was, I, I think, from memory, and it's not a hard statistic, but I think it was just over half of what the peak was in January. Um, so we have a really high, as you said, comparatively speaking, a high case numbers, um, over a thousand cases per day usually, and it's gone up a little bit this week, as one of the members mentioned. Um, but the impact on hospitalizations and deaths, we haven't seen that translate at the same level as before, and that is because of the success of vaccination. Um, so vaccination is very much the key to, to this, um, and plea to anyone who hasn't got themselves vaccinated and is eligible to please think about that again. Um, and, and we now are focusing on the hospita hospitalizations and the deaths, and that is where we look to. Um, if we can keep um, those low, keep them within health healthcare capacity, then the, helping the economy and society recover is, is not necessarily against protecting health, they're not, they're not necessarily opposed. So it is a balancing act, as Peter mentioned. I don't know, Peter, do you want to say anything more on that from a policy no, side? No, okay. I think you've covered it well, Liam, thank you. Okay, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, yeah and that, 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 there are, there are um, some considerable um, concerns around the levels of cases and the fact that people, while, while you have indicated there are Elaine, that the seriousness of cases may have reduced. There are still people dying, for, for a start, and also people are still getting seriously ill, including people with long COVID, and in particular, maybe young people with long COVID. So are you indicating to us that, that there has been a change in direction and a change in focus now, and that, uh, that, that is, is this a form of herd immunity that we're, we're seeing now? No, no, it's not a change in focus. We've always looked. Am I, yeah, I am. Uh, we've always looked at both case numbers and hospitalisations as part of the decision making the whole way through COVID. Um, so, so that still remains. Um, I, but as case, it is natural that case numbers will will be higher whenever we are mixing them compared to when we were in lockdown. And I guess that was really just the point I was trying to say there. Um, so no, and, it's and, not a, a change in policy as such. And in relation in relation to the hospital and the modelling around the hospitals, the health committee have for some time now requested that the modelling of the critical care beds uh, be provided to the committee. We still haven't received that. Do you have any further information on that, Elaine, or could you bring that query back with you if you don't have any further information as to when we can expect that to be provided? Yes, I'll take that back. I, 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 I thought that was published, but perhaps it isn't. Um, and so I'll certainly take that back and, and see what we can provide committee if it's not uh, publicly available already. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for your attendance, uh, all of you today, Richard, Peter and Elaine. We will now move on to our uh, SR by SR consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, members, I refer you there to papers at tab nine of the pack. Um, have any members any further issues to raise in relation to? Um, so we're moving we're moving on to each of the SRs in turn, and the first SR that I will be going to is SR twenty twenty one forward slash two seven four. Um, these SRs are subject to the confirmatory resolution procedure. The rules have been considered by the examiner of statutory rules, and she has raised no issues with them. So going then to SR 2021 forward slash 274, uh, I refer you to papers at tab 9. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to this SR? No, thank you. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Number 6 Regulations 2021 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Great. Thank you. SR 20, 2021 forward slash 276. I refer members to your papers at tab 10. Have members any further issues to raise in relation to this SR? Chair, just uh, when do we have to make a decision on this SR by? Pardon, Jerry? When do we have to make a decision on this SR by? Um, we have a wee bit of time on this one. Um, I think they're scheduled at the minute for the first week in November. So okay. they are these ones. So. Um, if members did have concerns, we could seek further information for next week. Yeah, if, if the committee and chair agrees, I think there's there's questions around modelling here, and you know expected cases, and um, maybe some input from the CMO and or CSA, um, because I think there's there's really 
concerns around this, uh, and if the, the decision or the advice coming back is, is clear, then it's clear. But I think there's there's some question around this, so I would like to suggest we seek that information if the chair and committee would agree. Members sure. agree? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, sure. You know, as I say, look, I'm, I'm not going to divide on it, but I don't think um, any other additional information would probably give the clarity um, that Jerry or others will want. So okay, I'm content to, to approve as as is now, rather than prolonging and coming back again. But if it's the mind of the committee to, to put it back, I'll not divide. Okay, members generally content that we seek a bit more information in relation to how the modelling is being applied here and how it, uh, how it impacts through to the advice. Yeah. Absolutely, you. Chair. I would support Jerry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, members. So we'll defer formal consideration, uh, individual consideration of that one. Sure. Okay. Moving on, then, members, to the international travel regs. Um, and the next two agenda items are SRs on international travel restrictions. Um, there, again, there was an additional rule added to the meeting in, it, in table papers, but I, I propose that we defer those to allow members better time to have a, a scrutiny of that. Uh, I refer members to the clerk's memo in table packet 11.3. Officials are here to brief the committee today uh, on the provisions of the regulations. So I'd now like to welcome Ms. Carol Picton Linus, who's head of Health Protection Branch 3 in the Department of Health. Are you there? And can you hear me okay, Carol? Hello, good afternoon, Chair. Sure. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I also have with me uh, Deborah Sharp, who's also working in the um, Health Protection Branch 3, too. Okay, um, thank you. I'll just check okay. with Deborah. Deborah, are you able to hear us and check that we can hear you? Deborah is Deputy Head of Health Protection Branch. Can you hear us okay, Deborah? We're not hearing we're not hearing you at the minute, Debbie. No, I'm not sure if there's anything in your settings you can adjust. But at this minute in time we're not hearing you. I'll check again. Can we hear you now, Deborah? No, we're not hearing Deborah. Do you want to go ahead with the briefing, Carol? And we will okay. we will see if we can get back to to Deborah in terms of the question and answers. Uh, were you expecting Deborah to provide opening remarks as well, Carol, or is that just your? No, 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 no. She's just here um, in in terms of um, answering any any queries um, that I'm not on it that I'm unable to. Uh, Chair, can I just clarify then? Did you did you say that the SR two SR two one 2021 number 282 is not to be discussed today. Yes, yes, yes. we're going to defer to the two. That's fine. So, um, thank you uh, for the invitation to attend today's meeting uh, to the committee. Um, the committee is considering two statutory rules then that have been made to generally underpin earlier executive decisions taken in relation to international travel at its meetings during July, August. In September. Um, this suite of regulations underpin the executive's agreement to align with the UK government and the other devolved administrations in relation to the introduction of a new global ta travel task force framework, as well as other relaxation of border measures in relation to international travel and the three weekly cyclical review of countries. The outcome of which takes into consideration detailed analysis of risk undertaken by the Joint Biosecurity Centre. If the committee is content, then I will briefly summarise each set of regulations in the order in which they were made. So the first one is SR 2021 number, two, number 262, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Amendment Number 6 Regulations Northern Ireland. They came into operation on the 22nd of September 2021, and these regulations made changes to the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Regulations and Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations commonly known as the principal regulations. These regulations were made to insert a definition of a cruise ship to enable critical exemptions in respect of passengers of cruise ships to be introduced. It also they also introduced a technical amendment to allow cruise ship passengers to submit their passenger locator for up to 21 days before arrival. And so in effect, the current PLF window means that almost all international cruise passengers will have to complete the PLF on board, either at sea or before they disembark um, in Northern Ireland. Technical issues in the cruise environment create a significant compliance risk from passengers not completing their PLF correctly or on time. Allowing cruise passengers to complete the PLF in advance of boarding ensures operators will conduct PLF checks on passengers. Without this change, operators have raised strong concerns with the technical ability to comply with the current PLF requirements as passenger numbers increase into the second half of September and October. Passengers will be advised to complete it in the 48 hours prior to boarding to ensure accuracy of information. 
Regulations also provides for a reasonable excuse for a person to contravene Regulation 6 of the principal regulations, and that regulation is the requirement to possess a negative pre-departure test, where a person who undertook a qualifying pre-departure test on board the cruise ship, and that test was um, subsequently tested positive, um, then they arrived in Northern Ireland. Um, so the reasonable excuse is not a reasonable practical for that person to disembark in a country or territory other than Northern Ireland. The regulations also amended Schedule 1, the red list of countries, um, to the international travel regulations to admit to omit Bangladesh, Egypt, Kenya, Oman, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, the Maldives and Turkey. They also amended Schedule 2B, the criteria to be a fully vaccinated amber list arrival, to include within the criteria people who received a, dose, a course of doses comprised of two different authorised vaccines, in other words, mixed doses. They also created an exemption for international cruise passengers to the effect that non-disembarking cruise passengers and crew are exempt from completing a passenger locator form, pre-departure testing, post-arrival testing, self-isolation or enter managed, managed hotel isolation. A, cru a, short, a short stay cruise passenger due to depart from Northern Ireland on the same cruise ship within 48 hours of their arrival are exempt from day two or day eight PCR testing. Um, there's also a minor amendment to the principal regulations to take into account any reference to the Public Health England as a consequence of the dissolution of Public Health England, um, which was renamed as the United Kingdom Health Security Agency. The regs also correct two minor drafting errors. And also Schedule 8, prohibition on arrival of aircraft and vessels is also amended to omit Turkey, as Turkey is omitted from the list of red list countries. The Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passenger Regulations are also amended to include a defence for an operator to allow a person to arrive in Northern Ireland where that passenger had undertaken a pre-departure test which returned as positive and it was not, not reasonably practical for the relevant passenger to disembark in a country or territory other than Northern Ireland. If you contend, I'll go on to the second um, set of regulations, SR 2021 number 278, yep. the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Amendment number 7 regulations. They came into operation on the 4th of October, and these regulations made changes to the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations 2021 and the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Regulations 2021. These regulations were made to underpin the executive's decision to align with the UK government and other devolved administrations to introduce a new global travel task force framework, which changed the rules for international travel in respect of the red, amber, green traffic light system to a new system of red list countries and simplified travel measures for arrivals from the rest of the world, referred to as non-red list countries. These regulations also provide that fully vaccinated arrivals from the new category of non-red list countries who can show proof of vaccinated status are exempt from pre-departure testing, day eight post-arrival testing and self-isolation. The regulations also expand the fully vaccinated policy to an additional tranche of countries, including Antigua and Barbuda, Bahrain, Barbados, Brunei, Dominica, Israel, Japan, Kuwait, Malaysia, New Zealand, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and the United Arab Emirates. They also changed the nature of the medical evidence that travellers from red list countries and territories must provide if they seek exemption from the obligation to quarantine in designated accommodation. The regs also um, relieves operators of the obligation to check evidence of vaccination where a, a traveller's passenger locator form has had appropriate evidence uploaded to it and which states that the evidence has been verified. And it also changes the information that operators must give to passengers to reflect the changes made by these regulations. So that's, that's in a summary of those two regulations, Chair, and Debbie and I are happy to take any questions on those issues. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll go first of all there to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair. Just taking a wee minute to get it off me up there. Um, I just wanted to ask one question, um, really, in, la in relation to if there are any outstanding issues in respect of cruise ships or passengers arriving in Northern Ireland from sea. Um, outstanding issues in what respect? Um, so we have um, introduced um, exemptions uh, for um, arrivals on international cruises to um, enable to them, if they're not disembarking, for example, they, they don't have to um, complete a passenger locator form or undertake any of the pre-departure or post-arrival testing. You mean in terms of when they, di when they disembark? Yes, not... uh, and I suppose maybe in relation to previous reports of 
um, passengers not being allowed to disembark as well. Obviously, you want people here coming as tourists to Northern Ireland to actually be able to enjoy Northern Ireland and, and contribute to our economy. Yeah, I, I believe there were some issues at one point where the, the um, operators of the cruise ships in their guidance um, did not allow certain passengers to disembark off the off the ship um, and that was in that was their protocols and that was their guidance at the time but our current regulations allow for fully vaccinated uh, arrivals from non lit from non red list countries to arrive in northern ireland so you know and travel freely within northern ireland so long as they can show their proof of vaccination status okay so the fact that people weren't allowed to disembark at that time was actually nothing to do with our regulations. No, that, that that was the that was the guidance and the the um, the cruise ships policy at the time, um, but the regulations okay, uh, allow allow for international travel arrivals. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, members, and thank you, thank you, Carl and Debbie. I think that is everything on that. So we'll move on now to our formal consideration of each of them. But I want to thank you for your attendance and your uh, assistance at committee this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, members, so we'll now move on to each of the SRs in turn. And uh, these SRs are subject to negative resolution procedure. The examiner has reported on these rules and outlines that uh, they are in breach of the 21-day rule, but she is content with the department's explanation for that. Um, Carol, we can, we can let you go now if you, if you wish. Yep, thank you. So I refer members then to SR 2021 forward slash 262, which is in papers at tab 11. Have members any further issues you wish to raise in relation to that SR? No, thank you. So if not then, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 262, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel, Operator Liability and Information to Passengers, Amendment No. 6, Regulations NA 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Number 12 is SR 2021 forward slash 278. I refer members to the papers at tab 12 of your pack. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to this SR? No. Thank you, members, then. Uh, can I ask members to agree formally? That the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 278, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel, Operator Liability and Information to Passengers, Amendment No. 7, Regulations 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, thank you, members. Item 9, then, we have deferred. So moving on to item 10. No, sorry, that was the final item in that section. So then, members, what we will be doing is moving to item 13 on our agenda, and this is in relation to the severe fetal impairment abortion amendment bill. Members, we will now move into a closed session to continue our deliberations on this bill. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.